there was a high-profile showdown at Feijue's Martial Arts Academy. Situ Jantian accused his interlocutor of seducing his brother's girlfriend. Situ Jantian added that Xiaolan had to apologize to all of Situ Jantian's family. The other students at the academy complained about the problems created by the showdown between the two guys. Xiaolan said again that he had nothing to do with Bu Xiaoman and would not apologize for something he did not do. The angry Zitu Jantian threatened Xiaolan and asked him to apologize once again. Xiaolan said that there would be no explanation, and if Zitu Jantian wanted them so badly, it would only be to his mom. Then he sent his donkey to attack Zitu Jantian, running up to him. The donkey began to mumble something inaudible. Zitu Jantian told Xiaolan to come after school and threaten to fight. Xiaolan agreed and said that he was not afraid. After that, the two separated. From the other disciples' observations, Bu Xiaoman really was somehow interested in Xiaolan. Perhaps she wanted to shame Situ Jiantian. Xiaolan still came to the bout offered to him. Situ Jiantian noticed Xiaolan's bravery. The other students were already anticipating Xiaolan being beaten and left crippled. In their opinion, Situ Jiantian was very strong. Suddenly, Bu Xiaoman descended from the air. Everyone began to wonder why she might have come, speculating on all sorts of theories. Bu Xiaoman said that no one was allowed to observe and told the disciples to leave to their own devices. Some disciple objected, but another immediately shut him up. They were forbidden to go against Bu Xiaoman's wishes. Situ Jiantian began to show off his sword to Xiao Lan. His sword was called Zhan Hong and was made of a chilling metal, sharp enough to chop with a single blow. But Situ Jiantian stabbed his sword into the ground and said that using a sword would just be bullying Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan also threw away his decrepit sword and agreed to a fair duel without any allowances. A smile appeared on Situ Jiantian's face. Suddenly, his sweatshirt ripped and a golden breastplate appeared on him. With this armor, Zitu Jiantian's strike was equal to the strength of 20 tigers. Xiao Lan would hardly have been able to counter such an armor. Situ Jiantian rushed into the battle and wished Xiao Lan to die. After all, he shouldn't have attempted to kill Bu Xiao Man. While Zitu Jiantian swung for a punch, Xiao Lan counterattacked and was able to break the bib. Shi Tu Jiantian flew back from the blow and immediately blacked out, automatically losing the duel. Xiao Lan said that Shi Tu Jiantian shouldn't have blabbed, but just hit if it was a brawl. Shi Tu Jiantian was able to move away from the blow and sat in awe as he looked at Xiao Lan. Reflecting on his strength, which was twice his own strength, all Xiao Lan wanted was to be calm. Taking out a knife, he threatened Shi Tu Jiantian and told him to leave him alone. And if he continues to torment Xiaolan, the entire Situ Jiantian family will be killed by Xiaolan. Xiaolan noticed someone approaching and asked Situ Jiantian to play along in order to hide his powers. Xiaolan fell to the ground and started rolling back and forth, asking Situ Jiantian to stop beating him up. Situ Jiantian noticed Bu Kao Man in the air. Xiaolan was again told to play along by Situ Jiantian and he agreed. The beaten Situ Jiantian got up and told Xiaolan that his beating would be even harsher next time. He began to play up his part. The disciples noticed Xiaolan and thought that Situ Zhongtian had won, and supposedly Xiaolan shouldn't have come to the duel at all. Two opponents fought in the arena. A dark horse, a lone wolf, and a mystical beast were doing a duel to the death. The tiger jumped at the man to attack. The man grabbed his paws and began to hold on. The observers on the arena benches began to cheer. Miss Ya lay on her bunk and asked her maid if this was what she was supposed to see. Her maid confirmed that yes. Miss Ya did not understand the meaning, for there was no way a novice warrior could defeat a mystical beast. Running his tongue over Ms. I's lips, I said that if he could survive, he'd have a chance at the bedside. The warrior became angry and tossed the tiger into the sky, sending it outside the Colosseum in a split second. Then, far in the air the mystical beast exploded for no reason whatsoever. The arena began shouting his name numerous times. Xiaolan's victory was terrifyingly spectacular. Miss Yi noticed what Xiaolan had done and immediately called her maid to bring him to her. The leader who started the fight between the beast and Xiaolan thought, if he couldn't withstand Miss Ya's temptation, then he certainly wouldn't be worthy of being elevated to the heavens. Miss Ya requested Xiaolan to her bed, tearing the curtain he noticed Miss Ya in her underwear. Miss Ya called Xiaolan to her bed, but he unexpectedly just threw the blanket over her. Xiaolan didn't care at all about Miss Ya's temptations. He tied her up with a blanket and started to leave. With a wave of his hand, Xiaolan swept his hand over the fact that Miss Ya's lead bedroom didn't look very interesting and tempting. Xiaolan walked out of the building with a smile. Miss Ya was furious at Xiaolan and never intended to forgive him for what he had done. Xiaolan came home, opening the door, he was greeted by a black-haired woman in a green dress. Walking over to his aunt, Xiaolan sat down on his lap and apologized for the disturbance on her part. 
she asked her not to do such reckless fights again. Xiaolan revealed that the prize for third place in the academy tournament would be a phoenix pill. With this pill, Xiaolan would be able to cure Auntie's leg. Xiaolan went to his room to rest. Auntie was angry and intended to crush the Situ family if they dared to attack Xiaolan. The next day, Xiaolan was sitting at the entrance, yawning and passing. Suddenly, he heard a dialogue between the students behind him. The students were discussing the new instructor, who would be a woman. She belonged to one of the three strongest families in Yao Wan. Suddenly, a woman appeared behind Xiaolan's back. She introduced herself as Miss Liu Ya's new instructor. In addition to instructing, Liu Ya is in charge of the academy tournament for a whole month. While Xiaolan was buried in his thoughts, Liu Ya presented the first lesson to the students. The topic of the lesson was about divine spirits. The disciples were overjoyed, for divine spirits are the strongest thing in the entire Yao Wan country. Everyone was interested except Xiaolan. With a heavy sigh, he realized that it was going to be another lesson on a topic he was familiar with. Xiaolan revealed that everyone had a chance to awaken a divine spirit at the age of 18. And after successfully awakening, one could learn many powerful spirit attribute techniques. Liu Yo was explaining about the ranks in spirit awakening. At the same time, Xiaolan was having fun in his seat. Ignoring him, Liu Ya added that by awakening the spirit, the government would reward that one with a title and benefits. Trying to contain her calmness, Liu Ya finished. Xiaolan immediately smelled that he wouldn't feel good after what he had done. Xiaolan wanted to run away with the other students for now. Liu Ya didn't notice him. Turning around, he quietly started to leave. Liu Ya pulled Xiaolan's cheek and said that she needed him for a conversation in the office. Liu Ya sat on the chair and asked what she should call Xiaolan. Xiaolan, on the other hand, asked her to say what she wanted quickly. She suggested that Xiaolan be hired by the Liu family, for they would be able to do everything to get Xiaolan to awaken the divine spirit. With a smirk, Xiaolan said that it was rumored that none of the more than a hundred people were able to awaken their divine spirit. Xiaolan asked how they would help him. Liu Ya moved closer to Xiaolan and said that their family had their own ways. The embarrassed Xiaolan ran away and asked to be given some time to think about this proposal. At home, Xiaolan asked his aunt what would happen if he was able to awaken his divine spirit. Auntie said he could take other people's divine spirits. Heaven created people with innate divine spirits. But there's a chance they can be taken away. Auntie added that this method was harder than rising to the heavens and was worth trying your best for. While walking around the academy grounds, the students were saying that Situ Jantian had returned and Xiaolan should have prepared before another fight. Situ Jantian called out his brother and a few people from the Jitu family calling Xiaolan all sorts of names along the way. Xiaolan threw the knife at Situ Jantian's feet and once again recalled the last time he had been beaten up. Situ Jantian's older brother gave Xiaolan two choices. Either he would break his leg or he would kneel for two hours at the entrance of the academy. Xiaolan asked what would happen if he didn't choose anything. Situ Jongtian's older brother said that he would kill Xiaolan and his crippled aunt otherwise. Xiaolan said that he would choose to beat up big brother Shitu Jantian until he begged for mercy. Before he could even react, the eldest brother of the Shitu family flew away from Xiaolan's blow. He managed to stand up after the blow but was breathing heavily and shaken from the effects of the blow. The eldest brother of the Zitu family got angry and said that he would kill Xiaolan and then lunged at Xiaolan again. But once again, Xiaolan's punch knocked him back. He didn't want to admit his defeat to a low-ranked fighter and started using more and more tricks of all sorts. Shitu Jantian rejoiced at Xiaolan's attack. His brother was able to learn a strike from the secret tiger technique after all. Xiaolan considered this technique to be utter garbage and smashed brother Shitu Jantian's strength without any difficulty. Xiaolan put his foot on him and said that if he dared to threaten his family, the Zitu family would be wiped off the face of the earth. In Zun, the eldest of the Saitu family, appeared at the scene of the battle and wanted to see the one who dared to attack the Saitu family. The eldest brother of the Situ family asked Xiaolan to kill him, or else the whole Xiaolan family would know death. The eldest of the Zitu family joined in the dialogue and told Xiaolan to release him, otherwise he would know suffering worse than death. Taking out the knife, Xiaolan had a brilliant idea and wanted to let him go after doing something. Xiaolan began to cut the Zitu family's elder brother's clothes in front of all the students, and the Zitu family's eldest brother. Xiaolan swung his leg for a kick while the elder brother of the Shitu family tried to cover himself with nearby objects, and immediately sent him to the nearest white monkey statue at the academy grounds temple. Shitu Yingshun was furious at what he saw as the eldest of the Shitu family he intended to kill Xiaolan. The strength of the elder family's attack was beyond Xiaolan's strength. He couldn't dodge and couldn't take the blow either. Being in a stupor, Xiaolan accepted his fate. 
Liu Ya appeared beside him and made a shield asking the eldest of the Shitu family to talk. Situ Ying soon became even angrier. He asked how come Liu Ya dared to stop him without any either or reason. Liu Ya suggested that the Liu family deal with Xiao Lan and asked Sita Yingshun to do her a favor. Situ Ying soon asked her not to talk nonsense and refused to do favors or listen to Liu Ya's suggestions. He ordered his subordinates to catch Xiao Lan, and a dozen warriors appeared from behind Shi Tu Yingshun's back. All the warriors flew away from the loud explosion. After that, the fiery lions scattered all the traveling warriors of the Si Tu family. The eighth master of the House of Rain appeared and intervened in the battle, asking Sita Yingshun to leave with his boys. Situ Ying soon asked to do a favor for Situ's family and give up for their good relationship. The eighth master refused and said that he didn't need to be on good terms with the Situ family. The eighth asked again if the Situ would be leaving. Situ Ying Sung laughed and ordered his warriors to make a formation. The warriors surrounded the eighth master of the rain house in a hexagonal shape, and a green line was drawn between them. After that, the formation of a large mythical turtle appeared, completely engulfing the eighth master. Xiao Lan wanted to help the master. Liu Ya blocked him and said that he was not their equal at all. The eighth began to accumulate power and said that he only needed one strike to completely destroy the turtle formation. Saitu Yingsen himself began to pour green energy into the turtle and said that he wanted to see the power of the rain house. Just as the turtle began to enlarge, the eighth man's technique also finally came into action and he was enveloped by the huge head of the fire lion's wrath. Liu Ya swept up that the technique of the eighth was a high quality level one martial spirit. For Situ Ying Sun, this was the end. The eighth master found himself in front of the elder Situ and threw him away. The surroundings were an astonishment at the power of just one strike from the eighth master. This was the true power of a divine spirit. Xiaolan began to taunt the Saitu family. After the fight, Saitu Yingshun appeared naked just like the other members of Saitu. The disgraced members of the Jitu family ran away from the scene of the incident at the sound of Xiaolan's laughter. Xiaolan turned to the eighth master and thanked him for his kindness and help in the battle. Eighth waved his hand at Sao Lan's thanks and said that protecting him was just a small favor for fighting in the arena. Liu Ya ran up to Xiao Lan and took his hand asking how he was for she was worried. Just as the Eighth tried to say something he was interrupted by Liu Ya again, asking if Xiao Lan would join the Liu family. But Liu Ya was not the only one who invited Xiao Lan. Eighth also invited him to the rain village, leaving Xiao Lan with a hard choice to make. Liu Ya decided to tell her family's trump cards, recalling that half of Yao Wang's stores are owned by the Liu family. The eighth set his trump card too, in his village the daily income was a thousand gold pieces. Liu Ya moved closer to Xiao Lan and said that he could use it whenever he wanted by joining the Liu family. Xiao Lan was under an unrealistic onslaught from the two sides, and finally pulled eighth and Liu Ya away from the argument by saying that he had come to a decision. Xiao Lan folded his arms and said that he had decided to compete in the academy tournament for the time being, after which he would choose his family. Liu Ya decided not to push Xiao Lan now. She thought that she would get him sooner or later anyway. Eighth Master took Xiao Lan by the shoulder and said that he would always have his back. Xiao Lan thanked the master again and went on his way, apologizing for leaving so abruptly. Xiao Lan's auntie was in the clearing where the Eighth Master was. He was quite surprised by her visit. Xiao Ba bowed to Aunt Qing Yi and greeted her on behalf of his family. Qing Yi asked Xiao Ba to stand up. There was no need to do such honors. After all, Qing Yi was no longer part of the Xiao family. Qing Yi thanked Xiao Lan for helping her. Xiao Ba reached into his sweater and took out a blood token saying that he would worship it forever. Putting his hand on his heart, Xiao Ba said that Qing Yi and Qing Di would always be part of the Xiao family. Xiao Ba asked Qing Yi why she was suffering. After all, Back in the clan, her leg could be healed in a split second. However, Ching Yi refused the clan's help and asked her not to reveal what happened and whereabouts. At the end, Ching Yi added that she needed Xiao Ba to deal with Shi Tu. Ching Yi added, before leaving that after the showdown with Shi Tu, she and Xiao Lin would leave and would only meet again by the will of fate. Xiao Ba remembered what happened long ago in the clan. The clan head had been so busy looking after the Dragon Tiger Mountain that there had been casualties in the battle. Young Master Qingda died in battle. After that, Miss Qingyi left with young Xiaolan. There was gossip in the academy about the situation with Saitu Zhentian. Pissing off the Saitu family would be difficult. At this time, hundreds of warrior commanders and ten masters appeared outside. Perhaps Master Ba wanted to defeat the three great powers and gain full control over Yao Wan. 
There was a set on a stone slab in the form of a peculiar arena, with only three seats remaining. Xiaolan kicked the temple doors with his foot and appeared in front of the hulking crowd of disciples, eager to take one of the seats. Xiaolan jumped into the arena and requested a duel from Situ Jantian recalling the last fight. Fearful, Situ Jantian gave up and ran away. After that, there was another one who wanted to fight. Suddenly, a senior ranking member of the Sai Tu family showed up and said that they would forget about the previous incidents, and he was only here for the tournament. Situ Jantian couldn't forget Xiaolan's atrocities, but his older brother threw him out, insisting that it was the family's decision. No one wanted to fight Xiaolan and simply bypassed him with no desire to enter the arena. Xiaolan scoffed at his strength as suddenly someone from the Hulk pulled him away and agreed to a duel. The two men were already ready to fight. Then, in a lightning-fast second, they collided in battle. His opponent immediately found himself on the ground in a blackout. Xiaolan smirked and asked who else wanted to fight him. In the end, there were no willing participants and Xiaolan was able to make it to the last five participants in the tournament. The host also selected a special instructor to lead their academic tournament. Under the influence of Liu Ya and Bu Xiaoman, Xiaolan was about to withdraw from the tournament and not participate. During a fight between the girls, Xiaolan started to leave. The two girls noticed this and immediately called him back. But he didn't hesitate and excused himself. After coming home, Xiaolan was greeted by Qian Shun. He had to protect Xiaolan under Master Ba's order. Auntie said that they supposedly didn't need such protection, but it was still worth it to thank the Eighth Master. Xiaolan wondered what Master Ba had to do with his aunt, that he had sent a top-level commander to protect him. The next day, Xiaolan found himself outside the best academy of the Western region and admired its own beauty. Xiaolan's attention was drawn away by the man at the entrance. He was barring entry to everyone except students and instructors. At that moment, Master Phoenix was at the academy, and for the sake of general safety, he issued such an order. The students at the entrance didn't believe it and said it was purely for Master's protection. Xiaolan remembered the dynamite stick from Chen Sun which was like a signal for help, but decided to keep it. Suddenly, Xiaolan heard shouting. The voice sounded very similar to instructor Liu Ya. She was asking for help. Xiaolan ran inside the building and noticed the other tournament participants. They were just sitting there idly. Xiaolan was furious. Xiaolan wanted to help Liu Ya, but he was taken by the hand and told that they couldn't go against the will of Phoenix Master. Xiaolan enveloped himself with a flaming aura and sent everyone away. He needed to save Liu Ya. Master Phoenix pestered Liu Ya. She asked to stop, but the Master insisted that even screaming for help wouldn't save her. In a small room, three elders were discussing plans. One of them suggested destroying Yanyu village. Bu Jingyu wondered how the elder wanted to destroy a village with a hundred commanders, ten masters, and Master Ba, who had a top-level martial spirit. Su Tu Yuxiong said, You shouldn't stutter so fast. On his trip to the demonic mountain, he found a Mo Luo flower. Elder Liu family and Bu Jingyu were shocked as soon as they saw this flower. The Mo Luo flower was a high-quality poison according to Situ Yushun. If one ground up the Mo Luo powder, it would be able to corrode someone's fighting spirit. The plan was good, but Bu Jingyu had one more question. After destroying the spirit or even Master Ba himself, Yanyu village was still strong. Shi Tu Yuxun had a plan. He wanted to lure Xiao Lan into a mess after which the Eighth would come to his defense, and he would be killed immediately. Shi Tu Yuxun's plan was good, the same as killing two birds with just one stone. The wobbly Phoenix Master ordered Xiao Lan to immediately come out and questioned who he was. Xiao Lan swung to strike and called himself, Daddy of the Phoenix Master plunging into rage. Xiao Lan took him by the neck and asked him how he dared to touch his woman. Liu Ya stopped him. He was the mayor's only son. Killing him would have added a lot of problems. The protective master broke the window and jumped inside, saying that Xiao Lan was seeking death by attacking the master. Underestimating a defender would be a foolish act and Xiao Lan was cautious, concentrating his strength into a punch. After the blow, he flew back into the wall and coughed up some blood and decided to resort to last measures. There was a small crossbow on Xiao Lan's hand, and he pointed it at the Phoenix Master to pose a threat to the Defender. Xiao Lan said that as long as the Defender does nothing, the Master is safe. After which he told Liu Ya to run away. While Liu Ya ran out, Xiao Lan passed her an emergency checkmate from Defender Chen Shun. Master Phoenix's protector was quite sneaky and decided to strike at the defenseless Liu Ya. Xiao Lan threw the Phoenix Master towards the Defender and was able to protect Liu Ya from the blow. The master was very sick, and the first thing the protector had to do was to bring him back home, after which he would already take revenge on Xiaolan. 
Xiao Lan used all his trump cards to protect Liu Ya from the unwanted guest. Xiao Lan had only one option left. If his opponents wanted to play dirty, he intended to just kill them all off. The other participants in the tournament were surrounded by the subjects of the Phoenix Master, and at the same moment Xiao Lan descended with Liu Ya. Master Phoenix, who had already changed his clothes, ordered his subordinates to capture Xiao Lan and kill him. Taking out his knives, Xiao Lan said that in order to kill him, they would need to get nicer. After blocking the defender's attack, Xiao Lan threw a knife at him to retaliate. After the last skirmish, Xiao Lan's strength had greatly increased, and he was able to defeat the defender with a single punch. Concentrating his energy, Xiao Lan dashed over and scattered all of Phoenix Master's subordinates. Xiao Lan started thrusting towards the Phoenix Master. In fear, the latter shouted to his defenders to kill him quickly. The white-cloaked man appeared and saved Phoenix Master. He had another protector. The guy in the cloak had the power of a divine spirit. Master Phoenix ordered the defenders not to kill only the women, but to make meat sauce off the others. Medicine Emperor Ben Ding appeared before the battle. He flew in on his small cloud. Everyone immediately recognized the master. This emperor was one of the two medicine masters in the court. His medicine could revive a person even with just one skeleton. Liu Ya was Beng Ding's adopted daughter and anyone who attempted to harm her would die at his hands. Master Phoenix and his protector immediately began to say it was a misunderstanding and just a mistake, fearing for their lives. Ben Ding explained that his son died early. Although Liu Ya's daughter is adopted, he will defend her for the rest of his life. For his own safety and out of desperation, Master Phoenix commanded all his troops to retreat. Liu Ya bowed and thanked Beng Ding. He on the contrary apologized and said that the fault was on him for arriving late. In a burst of anger, Beng Ding turned around and called all the nearby tournament participants and general disciples useless trash. But with the arrival of a smile, Beng Ding took Xiaolan by the shoulder and praised Xiaolan's immense bravery. After which, the medicine emperor threw the pill towards Xiaolan and said that eating it would immediately restore his wounds. Once again, he patted Xiaolan's shoulder saying that he expected huge results from him in the upcoming tournament. After arriving at his place, Master Phoenix couldn't stop wishing Xiaolan and Liu Ya dead. Master Phoenix was given an idea related to the tournament. Since the tournament was on Mount Meru, they could make a trap. Xiao Lan came to his apartment and suddenly noticed a person within the confines of his bed. It was quite unexpected. As soon as Xiao Lan asked a question in the interest of finding out who was on his bed, Liu Ya came out from behind the curtain and hugged Xiao Lan. Liu Ya revealed that she was very scared. Her eyes let an ounce of tears fall, and she asked if she could stay the night with Xiao Lan. Liu Ya dropped her head into Xiao Lan's shoulder and talked about her history. Previously, when she was the daughter-in-law of the Mu family, she was also a respected lady of Yawan City, but her husband forced Liu Ya to sleep with clients and threatened her family in every possible way. Then Liu Ya's heart died and she became a widow. Liu Ya asked Xiao Lan if he disliked her too. After all, he spent hours being nice to her, and sometimes cold to her. Xiao Lan said that it's not like that. Liu Ya smiled and thanked Xiao Lan for treating her like a human being. Xiao Lan just hugged her tighter and said that he knew how she felt and could understand this pain. The next day the tournament was about to start. A lot of students were in a daze. The tournament had a rule. The host said that at the start of the tournament, all participants would go to Mount Meru and hunt monsters. The mayor of the city of Blazing Phoenix stepped into the conversation and said he would announce the start of this tournament. The mayor's words were interrupted by a servant who bowed down and said that an urgent message had come from the capital city. The letter said that the seal on the Dragon Tiger Mountain could no longer withstand, and it was worth bringing Master Xiao of the Xiao family to the capital city. Everyone immediately realized who they were talking about, that Master Xiao was a master of the Imperial Dimension and one of the strongest cultivators. Xiao Lan wondered why this master was so popular. Liu Ya came up from behind and said that this elder was one of the four great families. Xiao Lan thought about his surname. It was the same. Perhaps he had been part of this family in the old days. The Mur of Blazing Phoenix City needed to see the Xiao family elder urgently. Mur handed over the start and organization of the tournament to Huo Lie, and he implied that the tournament should go very smoothly. After which he jumped and was enveloped by the aura of a high-ranking heavenly spirit flame phoenix and flew away. Medicine Emperor Beng Ding wanted to visit the Xiao family elder for a small drink as well and flew off following Mera. Soon, Huo Li announced the start of the tournament and the contestants found themselves in the forest, facing all sorts of monsters. 
Xiaolan was lying on his donkey and eating a banana, while giving hints to others in the battle in parallel. Fei Yu had to remember to dodge the dodges. Xiao Xia shouldn't be petty. Xiaolan hadn't seen any sword attacks from him at all in the entire fight. Xiaoman was too afraid for her makeup and clothes. It wouldn't help her in a real battle. Zhang Tian looked as if he hadn't eaten breakfast at all. His attacks were too weak against the monster. Xiaolan stretched and said that following his words, the guys would kill the snake much faster. Fei Yu got angry and started to voice his displeasure towards Xiaolan. After all, he hadn't done anything at all. The snake started to attack, and in fear, Fei Yu fell to the ground, and there was no way he would be able to dodge it. Xiaolan threw his sword at the snake, and it was immediately thrown back by impact. The sword hit right on target, after which the snake fell completely, and its body was enveloped by explosions. In just one fell swoop, Xiaolan defeated it. Fei Yu was afraid of the snake and didn't want to die, even though the snake itself could no longer harm him. Xiaolan laughed with the whole situation and chopped off the head of the snake, killing it completely. The snake defeated Xiaolan turned to Fei Yu and said that he now knew why Xiaolan had come there. Everything was going according to Situ Jantian's plan. Suddenly, Xiaolan warned the other boys of the impending danger. After a little hissing and crunching of twigs among the woods, they were attacked by the exact same snake. But the snake was not alone. A whole group of snakes swooped down on the boys and surrounded them. Situ Jantian calmed down the frightened guys, because all the snakes were only coming at Xiaolan. Jantian also added that if others stood, the snakes would not attack them. After all, the monster's original target was Xiaolan. Xiao Man asked what would happen to Xiao Lan, but Xiao Sha said it was better to worry about himself first. To Xiao Lan, the snake's behavior seemed unusual at all. Usually they would not group so easily on a single victim. Gathering his aura, Xiao Lan jumped high into the air and started whistling, calling out to his donkey. Riding away on the donkey, Xiao Lan told the others to find a cave and hide there until dawn, then go to a safe area. There were others within the mountain range. Si Tu Jantian's plan was only going as he needed it to. Originally, Xiao Lan wanted to lure the snakes out one by one and kill them. But when there were more than 200 of them, it was useless. Xiao Lan smelled some strange odor. Looking at the nearest tree, he saw a mark from the claws of a three-eyed blood lion. Logically, snakes would be afraid of a beast much more dangerous than snakes. But suddenly the lion began to run away, as did Xiaolan. In the end, Xiaolan realized that someone was behind this, and the snakes weren't targeting him for nothing. Xiaolan jumped off Xiaobai and told him to leave first, while he diverted the attention of the snakes. Xiaobai snorted and transformed into a lush griffin, and flew into the air with a powerful gust of wings. If Master Phoenix was behind the atrocity on Xiaolan, he had promised himself to make him such a life that he would wish for his death. Every second one snake would die and another would come to replace it. It was like they were endless. If Xiaolan had a Xuan weapon, he would have handled all the snakes many times faster. It dawned on Xiaolan. If there was no weapon nearby, he could make one for himself personally. Xiaolan shoved the sword handle into the throat of the first closest snake and immediately took the beast by the tail. After that, Xiaolan started throwing the snake from side to side while killing it to make a weapon. Xiaolan made a weapon from the corpse of a snake. It petrified and formed a kind of sword. The quality wasn't the best, but it was enough for the rest of the snakes. Fighting with many snakes and using Xuan weapons exhausted Xiaolan, and he sat down by a rock for a rest. Someone came out from behind the bushes and started laughing, then remarked that Xiaolan was surprisingly strong. It was Master Phoenix in a military uniform. His training was strong. Master Phoenix even took the army behind him. Master Phoenix remarked that defeating over 200 snakes while still remaining virtually uninjured was amazing. Master Phoenix said that if Xiao Lan didn't die in the next 10 years, his achievements could shock an entire dynasty. Xiao Lan stood up and looked Master Phoenix straight in the eyes, then questioned whether he did or not. Xiao Lan couldn't act recklessly. The warriors nearby had loaded crossbows, which was what prevented him from doing so. Master Phoenix admitted that he was the one who did it with the snakes, but Xiao Lan also offended the people from the Fei Zhui Martial Arts Academy. It was a pity for Phoenix Master to kill a person with such unrealistic potential, but Xiao Lan's life was coming to an end. Xiao Lan said that his life only depended on whether Phoenix Master had the power to kill him or not. These words angered Phoenix Master, and he ordered the warriors to give a ply towards Xiao Lan, dodging the crossbow arrows with difficulty. Xiao Lan began to call out to Xiao Bai. The mythical beast Xiao Bai transformed back into a donkey and started running towards Xiao Lan. Master Phoenix was surprised by this discovery. 
Even at the cost of the end of time or their lives, Master Phoenix had to kill Xiao Lan and retrieve his mystical beast. Master Phoenix reminded Xiao Lan that it was almost impossible to escape from their war horses, and even if he could, he would be shot sooner or later. In fear of taking away Xiao Bai, Xiao Lan used his last trump card, the Dynamite Protector from Master Ba. A report came to the organizer, the assassins had entered the territory of Shumi Mountain. The organizer himself wanted to see the brave men who entered the mountain. Almost everyone rushed towards the mountain. Liu Ya, who was watching all of this, was scared for Xiao Lan and his safety. One of the arrows had already hit Xiao Lan, and he left a bloody mark on the tree. Phoenix Master's group continued to pursue him. One of the subordinates informed Master Phoenix that Xiao Lan was ahead at the bottomless pit. Master Phoenix thought this was a good place for Xiao Lan to die. After killing him, the master would simply throw Xiao Lan into the pit. The group caught up with Xiao Lan and ordered him to deliver the mythical beast into their hands. Xiao Lan himself was badly wounded. Xiao Lan refused to hand over his Xiao Bai to such a vile person like Phoenix Master. Xiao Lan was shot at again by Phoenix Master's order. But before doing so, he told Xiao Bai to jump into the pit. Master Phoenix was beating the tree with rage. He thought that Xiao Lan and Xiao Bai had decided to kill themselves by jumping into the pit. Xiao Bai became a bird and flew into the air. Master Phoenix immediately ordered to grab him. Xiao Lan didn't fall into the pit, but grabbed onto a rock. He was able to get the vine and seize the Phoenix Master's leg with it in order to take him with him. Master Phoenix began to insist that he could make Xiao Lan's every wish come true. But he pulled the vine and decided to kill both of them. The Phoenix Master's warriors were broken. Now they were about to be punished. Suddenly, someone came looking for Xiao Lan. One of the warriors rushed to Qian Shun and asked for help to save Master Phoenix, who had been dragged into the pit by Xiao Lan. Qian Shun kicked him and took him by the neck, asking where Xiao Lan was for he had no business with Phoenix Master. It would be nearly impossible for even an eighth master to save himself from the bottomless pit. But Xiao Lan would surely be dead. Qian Shun couldn't save him and intended to commit Harakiri. Elderly Master Xiao had recently come out of isolation. Qian Shun should have reported this to eighth master. He would definitely be able to send out a rescue team. It wasn't too late and Qian Shun rushed over in an effort to help Xiao Lan. The organizer arrived right after Chen Shun left and started asking questions. Where was Ho Yu? The warriors replied that Master Phoenix had been captured by Xiao Lan, whereupon one of the warriors could tell in fear that both had fallen into a bottomless pit. In that case, the organizer decided that all the other warriors should follow Master Phoenix's fate and die the same way. The organizer issued an order in the city. He reported that Phoenix Master had been captured by Xiao Lan, and it was urgent to inform the city lord and immediately arrest anyone who was or was involved with Fei Zhui's martial arts academy. In the same way, the other combat academies had to stop doing any activity and wait for the city lord's instructions. The members of Fei Shui Academy were arrested in a cage of yellow lightning bolts. Shitu Jantian was puzzled. He wanted Cao Lan dead, and now he was arrested and the Phoenix Master was also captured. The guard of the Flaming Phoenix City grabbed Liu Ya and led her to the cage as an accomplice. The guard added that if anything happened to Master Phoenix, Everyone in the cage would die. Liu Ya asked everyone where Xiao Lan was and what happened to him. They said they didn't know because they were arrested immediately. Shi Tu Jantian began to blame Xiao Lan as he had offended Phoenix Master and caused him harm. There were some new beasts in Lord Ba's arena. In the cage was a big three-eyed bear. Suddenly, the men's discussions were interrupted. The bear woke up and started raging for no reason at all. Master Chen Shun ran into Master Ba's arena and immediately started asking to activate the secret formation. Chen Shun immediately requested to notify the 8th master, for Xiao Lan had fallen into the bottomless pit. As soon as elderly master Xiao came out of meditation, dozens and even hundreds of people immediately came to visit him. Everyone was determined to wait even half a year to meet master Xiao. But no one knew when the door would open. The gate finally gave passage, but the surprised residents were immediately disappointed. An elder came out of the gate instead of master Xiao. The elder thanked everyone for waiting and apologized. Master Xiao had returned and needed to rest. This meant that the Xiao family would visit the residents at a later time, and then the Xiao family would visit each resident and express their gratitude to everyone in turn. The residents wished the best for Master Xiao, and they had to go about their business in frustration. The man stood at the grave, behind him was quite a large troop of warriors that knelt bowing before the admirer. The elderly master touched the grave and mourned that his son Qingdi had left the world before he did. The elder promised himself to find everyone who was involved in Qingdi's death and take their lives 
The elder turned to the warriors and asked a question, wondering where Chingi and his grandson were. One of the subjects was thinking whether or not to tell him the information, and Lady Chingi and young Master Xiaolan or not. After being ignored from the Hulk, the elderly master became angry and started emitting a purple aura. The master's aura was so strong that even the ground beneath him began to emit multiple cracks. The subordinate already wanted to give information about Xiaolan and Qingyi, but he was interrupted by the other guy behind him. The guy said that after his long search, he was unable to find the young master and Qingyi. The elder asked a counter question if the guy knew where they were now. The boy said he didn't know. Xiao Ba's subordinate, the deacon of the Xiao family went up and revealed that Miss Ching Chi and young master Xiao Lan were in the western city of Yao Wan. The elder asked how they were doing. Xiao Ba added that Xiao Lan was 17 years old and had already reached the basic warrior level. And just like that, Xiao Ba added that with this level, Xiao Lan was able to defeat two high-ranked warriors. The nearby warriors were shocked at what they heard. Young master Xiao Lan's potential was unfathomable. If nothing were to hinder Xiao Lan, he would awaken the divine spirit without any difficulty and become even stronger. The elderly master was glad that his grandson was alive and well. Whereupon he asked his warriors to bring him to him. Xiao Ba bowed to the master and revealed that he was sorry. Xiao Ba received a report from Yao Wan City. The elderly master learned that Xiao Lan had fallen into a bottomless pit in the Jumi Mountains, and they requested a rescue team. After hearing this, the elderly master immediately started looking for Xiao Futu in the crowd of warriors. Master asked Xiao Futu to summon a hundred Xiao blood guards and immediately advance them to Yao Wan to rescue Xiao Lan and search for Qing Yi. And if Xiao Lan was dead, the master ordered to find the culprit and cut his entire family from the face of the earth. The master turned around and ordered Xiao Ba to show everyone the way. Xiao Futu accepted the master's order and waited for Xiao Ba's instructions. Tainted winged dragons that are the blood guardians of the Xiao family have appeared in the territories. The dragons themselves looked graceful, blue skin and bluish fur enveloped their bodies. Small whiskers and a strong build emphasized their power. Master Phoenix woke up in the pit, thinking that he had already died. As it turned out, Xiao Lan had hung him from the vines. While Master Phoenix rejoiced at his fate, Xiao Lan mockingly watched him while holding the knife in his hands. Xiao Lan said that using his knife, he would cut off the vine and make the Phoenix Master die first. Master Phoenix began to persuade Shaolan not to cut down the vine, offering him all sorts of riches. Master Phoenix started begging Uncle Hole to save him. He came to the pit and saw Ho Yu. Shaolan threw his knife straight at Ho Yu's private place. The hit was crisp. Shaolan was being arrogant. Now the Ho Yu family would have no offspring whatsoever. There was no end to Shaolan's taunts. His bloodline had received its end, and there was nothing Master Phoenix could do about it. Shaolan laughed at Hole's words. He threatened to kill Xiao Lan with thousands of cuts. Xiao Lan decided to let go of the vine and fall into the depths of the pit. Uncle Ho Lu came down and rescued Master Phoenix, asking how was his condition. Ho Lu fed the pill to Ho Yu and decided to get out of the pit first, before sending someone to get Xiao Lan after him. Master Phoenix was in agony due to the immense pain and asked Ho Lei to avenge him. Xiao Lan woke up in the back of the cave. There was grass covered ground in the lowlands, and Xiao Lan was somehow alive. The surprised Xiao Lan saw Xiao Lan. He was floating in the air a little higher from Xiaolan himself. Xiao Bai was angry as it turned out. The veins and grass started trying to attack Xiaolan. Xiaolan was immediately enveloped by dozens of long blades of grass. They covered him like a mummy. Xiaolan tried to get out, but it was unsuccessful. Suddenly, his attention was distracted by the glow of the grass on him. The grass began to get hotter and hotter, getting to the point where Xiaolan's eyes were practically torsos. After passing out for a while, Xiao Lan was able to wake up already without the herb on him. Surprisingly, all his wounds had completely healed up. The grass on Xiao Lan's leg was still there, and was only getting tighter and tighter with time. Something was wrong, and Xiao Lan couldn't pull that grass off his leg, after which a purple aura appeared behind him. Noticing the large purple roots, Xiao Lan realized what was wrong. Apparently the grass had just cleaned Xiao Lan before feeding him. Xiao Lan had no way to escape either. The roots immediately grabbed his leg and threw him to the ground. The roots encircled all the major places on Xiaolan's body and immobilized him, lifting him into the air. There was no way Xiaolan could get out from under the roots. His efforts were even. As soon as there was a little hope, he was pierced through the root by the root. Xiaolan found himself in the space world. Physically he had passed out and the roots were trying to eat his soul. The roots immediately encircled Xiaolan's spiritual body from head to toe. This was an extremely bad sign for him. But on the verge of death, Xiao Lan realized that there was no way he wanted to die. Thanks to his willpower, 
he was able to get out of his grasp. At the residence of the Zitu family, three cloaked men called the subjects useless. The head of the city ordered Xiaolan and his family to be killed. The man revealed that after their actions, there was not a single trace that led to Xiaolan or his relatives. One of the three subjects apologized to the Lord. Supposedly, they didn't know that the men from the House of Rain would come and take them away. The man in the cloak said they should immediately gather all their people and burn the Rain House to the ground. So Tu Ying Sun realized that with the help of Hofeng City, he would not only be able to destroy the Rain House, but also establish a relationship with the Hofeng family. In the House of Rain, one of the subjects asked my lady to leave the House of Rain, for the enemies were already gathering forces to destroy their base of operations. Milady Ching Yi listened to her subject's explanation. At this moment, the Eighth Master was not around, and with the current strength, it would be impossible to win. Ching Yi said that they shouldn't have hidden from a bunch of clowns who can't accomplish anything. The subject put a knife to his throat and said that if Ching Yi refused to leave, he would die. Another subject made a report. The rain house was surrounded by about 200 soldiers. Ching Yi wanted to see which audacious fool intended to attack her head on and asked to roll her outside. One of the closest students said it was my lady's will and her stubbornness could not be contradicted. The subject said that they would all die. Lady Ching Yi turned around and replied that no one knows the outcome of the battle yet. Shi Tuying Shun wondered, if the Jitu family and the rain house didn't have any problems, then why were they so protective of Shaolan? The Lord told Situ Ying Shun not to be afraid, for the rain house is even smaller than he himself expected it to be. The warrior's battle cry was interrupted by the creaking of doors. A glimmer of light appeared from the main door, and my lady Ching Yi could be seen. Situ Ying Sun thought that my lady had come out to end her suffering many times faster and without pain. In front of the four families, Ching Yi declared that if trouble happened to Xiao Lan, the Ho, Situ, Bu, and Liu families would be buried next to him. The lord of the Ho family said Ching Yi is that Xiao Lan's aunt. She is quite good at his thought, but does not appreciate kindness. The lord's words alerted Ching Yi. He said that young master Xiao Lan died at their hands. The lord of the Ho family added that Xiao Lan had harmed young master Ho Feng, and he didn't deserve to live. The warriors received the command to rush into battle, but they were immediately distracted by the earthquake coming from Ching Yi and her servants. The one who was carrying Ching Yi started to increase, repeating to himself that there was no way Xiao Lan could die. The warriors were immediately frightened by the size of this monster, and some of them began to retreat in fear for their lives. Master Phoenix's uncle shouted at young Master Xiao Dao to be careful. The lord of the Ho family thought that using his body to fight Qi attacks was foolish. The warriors were immediately torn apart by the monster's hands. The warrior's blows were useless against it. In all sorts of ways, warriors immediately fell in battle. Some were thrown, others were stamped into the ground. Situ Ying Sun jumped into the fray, for the monster's strength was too great, and it should have been killed already. A strange aura enveloped my lady Ching Yi. She possessed a martial spirit and could create blades. Situ Ying Sun thought that he was too damn strong, and some broken blade wouldn't be able to do much damage to him. He continued his attempted attack, after which that same broken blade also attacked, and the outcome was quite different from Situ Ying Sun's thoughts. A large tornado appeared from the sweeps of the martial spirit. My Lady Ching Yi's spirit was a divine level heaven wound and was called the Blood Demon Blade. The dragons protecting the Xiao family flew towards Yao Wan and suddenly noticed the Bloody Demon Blade. Recognizing that the lady was in trouble, they all rushed to the rescue. Seeing the Xiao family, the lords decided to give slack and run away. With their strength, they weren't even close to the Xiao family. Their journey was stopped by the god killer, Xiao Futu. Now the lords and the four families had surely lost their battle. Xiao Futu said that those who dared to attack Milady Qingyi would die. He then turned around and ordered everyone to kill the opponents. Xiao Futu walked up to Milady Qingyi and kneeled down and said that he was paying his respects to the young Milady. The remaining families of the enemy realized that they had provoked someone who shouldn't have been bullied at all. Xiao Futu apologized for being late and told Milady that he was willing to suffer any punishment. Ching Yi paid no attention to his words and started asking questions with the intentions of finding out why he had arrived. Xiao Futu explained that it was my lady Ching Yi's father's decision to bring her and young master Xiao Lan to him. Upon hearing about Xiao Lan, Ching Yi immediately gave the command to bring her to Shu Mi Mountain to the bottomless pit. At Xiao Futu's whistle, several dragons descended towards them, tearing the air currents with their wings. Xiao Futu asked what they should have done with the enemy warriors who were still alive. Ching Yi ordered to capture all of them. If Xiao Lan was dead, then each of them would suffer the same punishment. 
Shao Shan was ordered by Xiao Futu to take 30 men and capture every remaining enemy. One of the lords tried to run away. After the order, Xiao Shan immediately stopped him and proceeded to execute it. Those who tried to escape would die without a problem. So Xiao Shan showed the others that his intentions were serious. Master Xiao Ba was trying to find out where Master Qian Shun was. He didn't believe that Qian Shun was dead. The subject said that if young Master Xiao Lan was alive, Qian Shun would fight. Otherwise, he would return to the Xiao family and commit self-immolation. Master Xiao Ba said that if young Master Xiao Lan and Qian Shun were dead, they and the entire rain house would come to the Xiao family and atone for their guilt. The Phoenix Master warriors at the bottomless pit were waiting for others. Qian Shun returned to them to fool them. He changed into that very armor and got the badge of Lord of the Ho family and they believed. Qian Shun ordered the warriors to prepare a rope, for he immediately wanted to climb down the bottomless pit. It seemed strange to the warriors that a second group had already descended into the bottomless pit. But they didn't care. They were doing a job and getting paid for it. Qian Shun hoped that young master Xiao Lan was still alive. For not only Qian Shun but also the eighth master would die. Commander Ho Hu was puzzled why Xiao Lan didn't fly out of the pit, knowing that he had a divine beast with flight. His thoughts were distracted by a subject who had found Xiao Lan's location. The group immediately moved to meet Xiao Lan. After a short distance, Commander Huo Hu was knowledgeably surprised. Xiao Lan was still shrouded in huge vines of purple grass. The warriors were afraid to come closer. Ho Hu intended to be careful and ordered the warriors to simply climb onto the grass and cut off Xiao Lan's head. The frightened warriors dared to attack Xiao Lan, and after a little persuasion, they jumped into the attack. The purple grass did not like the behavior of the attackers, and simply pierced their bodies through and through. The warriors provoked the weed and it started killing all the nearby enemies. Commander Ho Hu ordered them to immediately run away. During his escape, Commander Ho Hu fell, tripping over a rock and looking at the grass in fear. Out of desperation, Ho Hu made a sneaky move and set his subject up for a hit instead. But this kind of meanness saved Commander Ho Hu's life for just a couple seconds. More roots started to wriggle towards Ho Hu. He begged for his life, but the roots didn't care. His body was pierced through by three roots. Each of the warriors had a couple of roots on them, sucking out their life force. The roots left on Xiao Lan enveloped him with a green aura and allowed him to open his eyes. To Xiao Lan's surprise, all of the enemies were killed, and his wounds healed again as if they were not even present. Xiao Bai turned back into a donkey and was finally able to come to Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan apologized for the excitement on Xiao Bai's part. Master Qian Shun found Xiao Lan and was madly happy that young Master Xiao Lan was alive and well. Xiao Lan first asked Qian Shun why he had come down. Qian Shun said that it was a long story and they should go up first. One of the ropes signaled to the warriors above. They immediately started pulling it upwards. The warriors rejoiced at the success of the Lord. Qian Shun said that the warriors would be rewarded for their efforts. The Ho family's subjects noticed an oddity. Qian Shun was heading towards a different city from the intended target. In addition, the subjects saw Xiao Bai and he too flew towards Qian Shun. After a little thought, they realized that they had been fooled. The warriors immediately ran to give word to the real lord. Xiao Lan swept up. They had indeed discovered their plan. Xiao Lan suggested splitting up. It would be best if they both split up. After all, it was Xiao Lan that they were looking for. Qian Shun and Xiao Lan's dialogue was interrupted by someone. In a split second, he was able to overtake the guys and stop them in their tracks. The Mur of the city, and by correspondence, Master Phoenix's father said they would both die immediately for injuring his son. The Lord asked who Xiao Lan was. Qian Shun pretended to be Xiao Lan and began to recall the Phoenix Master's deeds. Qian Shun called the Lord a foolish old man, and that it would be too early to kill him. The Lord was furious at all the words Qian Shun had said, and started attacking him with everything he could think of. Thanking his speed spirit past Flash, Qian Shun was able to dodge the Lord's strike. But the Lord laughed and said that he would not be able to get rid of it due to his speed spirit. The Lord struck Qian Shun with a ninth level heavenly force against the wind, and Qian Shun's blood scattered everywhere. Xiao Lan grabbed Qian Shun and they both hit the tree. With just one blow from the Lord, both of them were crippled. A large mark was left from the impact. Xiao Lan and Qian Yu Shun coughed up blood from the damage they had received. Xiao Lan asked if Chen Shun was okay. He apologized and said that he couldn't protect the young master. The Lord said that he already understood. Chen Shun wasn't Xiao Lan, as Xiao Lan himself doesn't have a speed spirit. But it didn't matter to him. The Lord wanted to kill both of them because they had messed with someone they shouldn't have fought with. Xiao Lan admitted that he was ashamed because he couldn't kill the Lord. Xiao Lan had not been able to awaken his spirit yet. 
Lord laughed and said that Xiao Lan reminded him of one thing that made him not want to kill him at that moment. The Lord promised that he would spend his entire life to kill everyone from the Xiao Lan clan. Xiao Lan and the Lord's fight was interrupted by strong gusts of wind. Dozens and even hundreds of Xiao family dragons flew from the red sky. Xiao Futu heard the Lord's promise and suggested that he start killing everyone just from him. Seeing the black abyss dragon with a heavenly soul, the god killer Xiao Futu himself, the Lord recoiled and asked if there was some misunderstanding between them. The surprised Xiao Lan didn't understand anything, but he was distracted by Auntie Qing Yi coming for him. Xiao Lan immediately rushed over to her in tears and apologized for making her worry. Auntie put her hand on Xiao Lan's face and said that nothing was important if Xiao Lan himself was fine. Approximately five dozen warriors fell on their knees in front of Xiao Lan and said that they were the protectors of the Xiao family's bloodline. The Fire Phoenix realized what kind of trouble it was in, but Xiao Fu Tu distracted it. He reminded him of the Lord's promise again and suggested that he should attack or Xiao Fu Tu himself would do it. The Lord said not to push him to do such a thing. Xiao Lan had brutally maimed his son and he demanded equal rights. Xiao Fatu said that he didn't care about all this and asked one last time who would attack first. Lord took off and told Xiao Futu to come to Hofeng City for a fight if he could. The Fire Phoenix said to kill him in front of the entire city. With a sneer, Xiao Futu ordered a part of the warriors to fly with him to Hofeng. Auntie explained that the Fire Phoenix is a complete fool. Xiao Futu is never afraid of power and will kill the master without any problem. Upon arriving in the city, the Lord asked for attention and ordered all warriors to prepare, the enemies were on their way. The Lord swept that he would reward anyone who was expressive in battle and didn't run away. The groups of Fire Phoenix warriors and the group of Xiao Futu warriors stood looking at each other. The Lord told Xiao Futu not to be so arrogant. He was the head of this city and simply cannot die in public. Lord told that supposedly Xiao Futu and him are of equal strength since both have attained divine spirit. Xiao Futu interrupted the Lord. He was fed up with all the heresy he was saying and wanted to get to the fight. Approaching Lord Xiao Futu put aside all formalities and said that he, on behalf of the Xiao family, declares war on the Flaming Phoenix family. The warriors of Hofeng City were terrified. Xiao Futu vowed to kill anyone who would go into battle. Xiao Futu told all the warriors that feared for their lives to get out for the last time. Most of the warriors began to flee. The Lord promised that he would execute the deserters for their behavior. Xiao Futu mocked the Lord and suggested that he surrender and give them a quick death. Lord Phoenix decided to counterattack and immediately opened his wings and told Xiao Fu to show all he could. Xiao Fu Tu was glad that the Lord had finally agreed to fight and began to gather his spiritual power. And like a stray bullet, he rushed towards Lord Phoenix. The Fire Phoenix himself was surprised by the speed. Warriors on both sides hoped for a draw from the impact. For if Xiao Fu Tu died, the Lord would kill the others, and if the Lord died, Xiao Futu would kill the enemies. The speed of masters was unfathomable to others. This was the level of heavenly soul emperors. Xiao Lan was completely shocked by their strength. Both masters had the strength of a tiger since they had such terrifying speed and strength. Auntie Ching Yi pointed out that this was not the strength of a tiger in any way, but precisely the strength of a dragon. Xiao Futu possessed over 300 units of dragon power. At the same time, Huo Feng had no more than 240 units of dragon strength. And if Xiao Lan tried his best, he could surpass them all. The Lord realized that he couldn't hold on forever and decided to use all his powers to kill him before then. The subjects observing everything noticed that Lord Ho Feng was using a soul battle skill. This ability was a heavenly level ability, and there was still hope for Lord Phoenix's victory. Xiao Futu waited a long time for the battle soul ability from Ho Feng and was finally able to use his trump card. Huo Feng saw Xiao Futu's Night Blade and realized that his soul combat skill didn't work against Xiao Futu. The glowing Xiao Futu said that he could do things that others couldn't do, and smirked. After which, in one deft move, he got behind Ho Feng and pierced him with the Dagger of the Night, and added a swirling kick at the sight of the injury from a second ago. Ho Feng didn't even have time to react to all of this. Ching Yi said that Xiao Futu used his Night Blade and apparently Ho Feng couldn't do anything in this situation. The crowd of warriors watched as Lord Fire Phoenix began to fall to the ground helplessly. Ho Feng found himself on the ground, there was a huge hole in his chest and his gaze carried no life in it. Seeing how terrifying Xiao Futu was, the other warriors fell to their knees and admitted their defeat. But Xiao Futu had given them a chance earlier. Now they would all die because they disobeyed his beliefs. The Medicine Emperor arrived on the battlefield using a wagon. The warriors began begging him for help. 
The medicine emperor asked Xiao Futu to stop this chaos. After all, Ho Feng was already dead. Xiao Futu didn't listen to the emperor. He began to ponder what could stop the madman Xiao Futu from doing so. As the emperor suddenly noticed Xiao Lan, he realized that Xiao Lan was part of the Xiao family and asked him to stop this chaos. Xiao Lan asked Anti if he could do that. And after answering, he asked Xiao Futu to stop. And after ordering Xiao Lan and Xiao Futu, the warriors stopped before killing all the enemies in front of them. The medicine emperor asked where Liu Ya was, and what was even going on here. After all, he had just returned from the Xiao family. Xiao Lan didn't know either. He turned to the warrior from Ho Feng and asked where Liu Ya and the others from the academy were. The terrified warrior said they were all locked up in jail on the orders of the deputy chief of the city. Xiao Futu asked my lady Qing Yi what they should do now. She said that they should release Liu Ya and the others from Fei Shui's martial arts academy. One of the Xiao family released the boys and began to lead them. No one understood what had happened. Shi Tu Jiantian played along in surprise, but he was actually only thinking of one thing. He wanted Xiao Lan dead. A group from Fei Zhu's martial arts academy came to the battlefield where dozens of soldiers had died. Liu Ya noticed Xiao Lan and was overjoyed. Si Tu Jiantian was sad, but Xiao Lan was alive. Xiao Lan extended his hand and asked Liu Ya to come over. She didn't know whether to do so at first but decided to go to Xiao Lan's side. Auntie Ching Yi noticed Liu Ya with Xiao Lan and was glad that Xiao Lan was able to grow up not only in terms of strength. King Yi asked Xiao Lan to return to Yao Wan City and asked Xiao Futu to deal with everything left here. Xiao Futu heard the order and agreed. Xiao Lan diverted the conversation and asked everyone to wait. Xiao Lan still had some things to do. He turned to Xu Jiantian with questions. Xiao Lan observed that the tricks that Zitu Jiantian did were good. The snakes almost killed him. Realizing that he had been exposed, Saitu Jiantian fell to his knees and began to beg for forgiveness and mercy. Xiao Lan drew his sword and slashed at Situ Jiantian's throat. Xiao Lan had warned him earlier and now the threats would come to fruition. Xiao Futu remarked that Xiao Qing had raised a good son. Auntie Qing Yi also noticed that Xiao Lan had grown in all aspects, but Xiao Man was sad. Because Xiao Lan was getting further and further away from her and she couldn't do anything about it. The subject asked Xiao Futu what to do with the remaining people from the Ho family. After all, my lady Qing Yi and Xiao Lan had already left. After a little deliberation, Xiao Futu ordered to kill everyone left alive around him. Xiao Lan asked what would happen to the enemies after they left. Aunt Qing Yi revealed that they would be killed and told Xiao Lan not to be so merciful, or he would be killed sooner or later. Qing Yi added that the people in the country are cruel and without killing them first. They might kill the entire enemy family. The reason why Xiao Futu was able to win so easily was his reputation earned over many years. Xiao Lan understood this, but he said that killing ordinary and weak people was somehow lowly. Qing Yi also said that they never and never kill the weak. It's a family rule to not kill the weak or the innocent. When they were both in Yao Wan City, Qing Yi wanted to tell the truth to Xiao Lan since he had already grown up. In the Yan Yu sect, Qing Yi said her full name and mentioned her father, Xiao Bu Xi who was the patriarchy of the Xiao family, one of the top families, and Xiao Lan's father's name was Xiao Qingdi. Xiao Lan's mom also died soon after he was born. Xiao Bushi's grandfather was trapped on Mount Lun Hu, so Qing Yi took Xiao Lan away. It turned out that Xiao Lan was a descendant of a great family. But Xiao Lan didn't care about his bloodline. He just wanted to be with Auntie. Standing up, Xiao Lan said, let Auntie Qing Yi choose for him what to do and where to stay. Auntie Qing Yi thought that Xiao Lan had better go back and honor his parents, and meet his grandfather. But there was nothing to fear on the way. They were under grandpa's protection. Qing Yi said that if Xiao Lan was uncomfortable in any way, they could leave this place every second and auntie would be by Xiao Lan's side. Xiao Lan asked if the phoenix pills had healed auntie's legs. She said no, and apologized for lying to him. Auntie said to Xiao Lan not to be angry, and in the Xiao family, they would find the best medicine for her feet. Xiao Lan asked about the eighth master. After all, he also worked for the Xiao family. For what did he fear so much for the orphan Xiao Lan? Xiao Lan started asking about all sorts of things. He would find out about his father's death when he became master level, and he would find out everything about his grandfather the next day when they were moving out. Already with Liu Ya, Xiao Lan told her what happened. He apologized because he didn't know about his family. Liu's family wasn't in any danger yet, as he would ask the eighth master to take care of their safety. Xiao Lan also said that he was going back to the Zhao family. Unfortunately, he couldn't take Liu Ya with him. But he promised to take her when everything was settled. Liu Ya, on the other hand, looked Xiao Lan straight in the eyes and said that she would wait as long as it took. 
A joyful Shaolan kissed her and told her to wait for him to come back and take her with him. Shaolan woke up in the night in terror. He remembered the purple roots that enveloped him at the bottom of the bottomless pit. Shaolan was tormented by the question of what it was. It was not a dream, but a reality. Shaolan decided to ask his grandfather about it later on. Liu Ya also woke up and cheered up Shaolan. She was glad that she had finally tamed the lone wolf. Shaolan thanked Master Xiaoba and said he would return the favor when he came to pick up Liu Ya. The moment of separation had arrived. Xiaolan went straight to the dragons to go to Xiao's family. Before departing, Xiaolan said that they would see each other again and finally flew back home. Xiaoba was surprised at Xiaolan's willfulness and intransigence. He wondered what kind of reactions Xiaolan would cause when he arrived in the city of the empire. The Jiang dynasty had a long history. It originated in the land of souls over a thousand years ago. Over the past thousand years, the Zi dynasty in the north had repeatedly tried to take possession of this rich land. But each time, they came back with nothing. Over the past hundred years, the royal power of the Zhang dynasty had weakened, especially because of the current overly violent emperor. He led an idle life, engaged in sexual acts, drank a lot, and was not afraid of anything. Even so, the Zhang dynasty is still very strong in the east. The Xi dynasty army never set foot on that land. All because the Zhang dynasty has four great families and the god of the army himself in its lineup. One of the most respected, strongest men of the Zi dynasty said that the Zhang dynasty would prosper, as long as they had four families in their ranks and the god of war. Watching the hulk of people from below, Xiaolan thought it was the Xiao family. He wanted to see his grandfather, most likely he is the best of the best. Auntie asked Xiaolan and Xiao Dao to come up to bow in front of their parents' grave. Xiaolan bowed and said that he was already 17 and would not let himself down in front of mom and dad. Auntie Qingyi told Xiaolan and Xiao Dao to go for a walk somewhere. She wanted to talk to her grandfather. Qingyi said that his brother and mother Xiaolan had been murdered in a dastardly manner. Grandfather said that Xiao Futu had already delivered the news, and once the elder had finalized his plans he would kill the culprits. Every last one of them. The elder mentioned Xiaolan and Xiao Dao's talent and asked Qingyi about it. She said that she had personally trained Xiaolan, and he would soon be able to awaken his spirit, and Xiao Dao was brought from the mountain of death. The guy seems to have lost his memory, but he has a terrible gift. Xiao Dao possessed reincarnation. He now had the strength of a high-level master. Especially after reincarnating, he couldn't be injured by ordinary masters. Qing Yi asked if the elder had encountered such a thing. He said he had never seen such a thing. There were no such races in the spiritual lands. Qing Yi said that she didn't know much herself. But if Xiao Dao's memory comes back, then there will be answers. In any case, they should have trained the guys well. They could bring unprecedented glory to the Xiao family. The elder asked Qing Yi to let Xiaolan fight against the geniuses of the greatest families. He could only become stronger through constant fighting. Abi Xiao Dao marveled at the size of this place. They were almost bigger than a whole city. Xiaolan said that it was better not to get into trouble since they were new to the place. Jin Xiao noticed the guys and swept up that Xiaolan had a rumor of how he killed two high-ranking generals. The subject informed Jin Xiao that the two guys in front of him were the members who had returned to the Xiao family. Xiao Dao called Jin Xiao a cousin. The guy next to him started laughing, because according to his memory, Uncle Qing Di only had one son, then assumed bad things about Aunt Qing Yi. Xiaolan turned to Xiao Dao and asked him how to punish him for insulting his aunt. Xiao Dao suggested breaking his legs. Xiao Dao jumped to attack the enemy. His defenders immediately appeared and rushed to attack Xiao Dao. Jin Xiao scoffed and told those not to blame him if they died by his or the defender's hands. But Jin Xiao's eyes widened in surprise. Xiao Dao immediately scattered the defenders without any difficulty. Xiao Dao was able to catch up with the offender after dealing with a group of defenders and wanted to break his legs. Xiao Lan joked that Xiao Dao was much kinder than him. After which, Xiao Lan mentioned the situation with the Shitu family. The frightened warriors could not fight back. Xiao Lan told them to lose themselves from his sight. The subject approached Xiao Lan and explained that by insulting Jin Xiao, he had insulted the entire Xiao family. Xiao Lan turned around and said, He doesn't care. He would kick the ass of anyone who came near him. A subject came to Xiao Lan and Qing Yi and told them about the new decree. Now anyone under 18 could challenge Master Xiao Lan to a fight. Qing Yi told Xiao Lan that he wasn't strong enough yet and should have remembered to break not just a couple of legs, but thirteen ribs in the future as well. Xiaolan asked Auntie if there were places in the Xiao family's city like a library. He wanted to find some information. Auntie said there was, and pulled out her token. Then she added that with the token, 
he should ask Jia to take him to the library. Xiaolan entered the library. Showing his badge, the mister in front of him said that he was allowed to read all the books on the first floor, but forbidden to go higher up the floors. Spiritual weapons, elixirs, spiritual beasts, a list of wild beasts, a map of the spiritual land and a list of cities, dangerous and abandoned places, a list of famous families, strong people and races on earth, a list of the souls of all warriors, deities, earth spirits, these many books. Xiaolan looked through. Soon after all, Xiaolan had found that very book, Chronicles of the Spiritual Land. Xiaolan had been reading all day long, but he still couldn't find anything about Wisteria. Fortunately, the Shower Festival was a few months away. Once Xiaolan awakens his spirit and improves his token, he will look on the second floor. If he doesn't find anything in the end, he will ask his aunt or grandfather. The subject relayed the order from the head to Xiaolan. He had to go back, shower and change his clothes because he was going to go to the palace feast. Xiaolan asked what this was all about. The subject began to explain that there were three great dynasties in the spiritual land, Zhang, Xi and Yu. All these dynasties have thousands of years of history. All this time, the three dynasties have been trying to destroy each other and unite the spirit lands, but all to no avail. Every dynasty has a royal family, for example, like the Yun family in the Zhang dynasty, and each such family rules the dynasty. The Zhang dynasty is a vast land, with hundreds of cities, thousands of villages, millions of villages, and hundreds of millions of people. For a long time, the grandeur of the royal family has been firmly established in the hearts. The towering palace in the center of the capital has become a place of dreams. But Xiao Lan didn't care even about that. All these words about dynasties, he wasn't afraid in spite of that. The Xiao family had already spread a rumor about how Xiao Lan had humiliated Xiao Jin and his arrogance, so it went like this. Xiao Lan's clothes seemed to glisten. New aspects had been added to his costume, which decorated him like this. The nearby girls were amazed by Xiao Lan's beauty, while the guys were envious of his elegance. The elder walked over to Xiao Lan and beckoned him to come closer to him. The people watching were discussing Xiao Lan. Xiao Qing's eighth son said that Xiao Lan was not bad, but would only be able to snag a high-level general with Xiao Kuang's awakened soul. Xiao Kuang said that you can't judge a tree by its bark. He thought Xiao Lan was quite unusual. In the corridor, the elder and Xiao Lan walked in the center. The elders in front congratulated Mr. Xiao for breaking the seal on Mount Lun Hu and returning with glory. Some lady had remarked that Xiao Bushi's strength was boundless. Twenty years ago, she had put up a memorial plaque for him but he was able to get out alive. She added that she didn't think the elder's life would be much longer. So there was no point in removing the plaque. Xiao Bu Xi turned to Xiao Lan and told him to be wary of the women of the Zuo family. He had once drunkenly slept with one and she was still holding a grudge against him. Xiao Lan understood his grandfather's advice and said that he would never go even close to the women of the Zuo family. The woman stood up and invited Xiao Bu Xi to fight if he didn't die. Then she intended to kill him here and now. The wind from the woman's aura was able to fell many people present in the hall, and even Xiao Lan could not stand steady from the mighty lady's strength. Xiao Bu Xi and this lady had at least eight duels in the past year, which she had never won. Xiao Bu Xi could have easily killed her. Another master stopped the evil old men. He told Ping that his majesty would be here soon, and she would still have a chance to fight with Xiao Bu Xi. His majesty, the legendary emperor, had arrived in the throne room. His subject immediately reported the loud arrival. Xiaolan was a little disappointed. In his opinion, the emperor looked like some kind of dandy. The emperor stepped to the center and said that he was pleased with Lord Xiao Bu Xi's arrival. This was a blessing for the emperor himself, the dynasty, and hundreds of millions of people. To such a high-profile event, the emperor offered a drink. The emperor sat down and recalled another important event. It was also the birthday of his 17-year-old princess Zishan. Moreover, two days before that, she had managed to reach the martial realm of senior general. The princess was allowed to dance by the emperor, but whoever impressed her, the emperor would guarantee their marriage. Xiao Bushi remembered how 20 years ago, the old emperor was still alive and was pondering whether the Zhan dynasty would be wiped out by this mediocrity. The joyous emperor requested Zishan into the hall to celebrate Lord Xiao's return together. Xiao Lan was perplexed as to why all the young masters were freaking out that Zishan would come over. Suddenly, a beautiful lady resembling a night butterfly entered the auditorium and said that she would be happy to perform the Nichang dance to celebrate Lord Xiao's return. 
In the eyes of Xiao Lan and all the young masters, Zishan was indescribably good. Literally everyone was mesmerized by her beauty. The emperor turned to the young masters again and asked if they were ready to show their skills to surprise the princess. Still, someone came to the center and bowed before the emperor. It was Zuo Ming, the most powerful young master of the Zuo family. Just recently, he had awakened a divine soul and became a general. But Zuo Ming turned to the young masters and said that instead of a show, he would like to have a duel with Xiao Lan. Zuo Ming wanted to see if Xiao Lan's courage was great. The other masters were hoping for a lavish fight because Xiao Lan had not yet awakened his soul. Xiao Lan stood up and said that he wasn't interested. In confidence, Xiao Lan was afraid that he would kill Zuo Ming. Zuo Ming saw Xiao Lan as a disgrace and thought that Xiao Lan must have feared his death at his hands. Zuo Ming's attention was diverted by Xiao Kuang. He proposed a duel instead of Xiao Lan since Xiao Lan didn't know the rules until the end. The two most powerful young masters entered the arena. Soon the fight started and Zuo Ming jumped high into the air. Zuo Ming tried to kick Xiao Kuang in the face from the air. Xiao Quan prepared his counterattack and they clashed. Except that after the collision, Zuo Ming remained on the ground without any injuries, while Xiao Kuang flew backwards and fell to the ground. Judging from Zuo Ming's energy, he had clearly broken through to a new level. The disciples were surprised by Zuo Ming's strength and praised him in every possible way. Zuo Ming asked if anyone else wanted to do a duel with him. The other members of the Xiao family were scared and afraid to come out. Xiao Lan didn't like Zuo Ming's words and decided to come out to fight him after all. Xiao Lan accidentally called Zuo Ming, Ji Ming. Xiao Lan apologized and said that he was just thinking about the chicken leg, so that's how the name came out. Zuo Ming said that supposedly Xiao Lan could call him whatever he wanted. He just wanted the duel to be quicker. Xiao Lan said, he is weaker than Zuo Min, but if he hurts him, let the Zuo family leader not blame Xiao Lan. Zuo Ming added a condition upon his defeat, Xiao Lan could take Zuo Ming's life. Zuo Ming made the attack first. He used a negligible skill with the purpose of testing Xiao Lan's strength. But Xiao Lan dodged and immediately became upset, making a kind of mirage for Zuo Ming. The disciples were perplexed. Was Xiao Lan really going to fight Zuo Ming face to face? Zuo Ming and Xiao Lan collided with a punch at each other. After that, somehow Xiao Lan had gotten around behind Zuo Ming's back. Xiao Lan kicked Zuo Min. Luckily for him, Xiao Lan did not hit his Achilles heel. Suddenly Zuo Min's eye was hit by Xiao Lan's technique. Xiao Lan must have pulled out a hidden weapon. The old lady of the Zuo family said that Xiao Lan should be arrested for using concealed weapons. Xiao Bushi laughed and told the old lady to unclench her eyes or give them to others in need. The subjects ran up to the young master and turned him over to see how he was. In his mouth was a chicken wing. Xiao Lan apologized for hiding the chicken leg and accidentally threw it into Zuo Ming's mouth. Xiao Bushi liked the joke and said that Xiao Lan could eat as much as he wished. The young students began to mock Zuo Ming's low defeat and Xiao Lan's joke. A furious Zuo family elder said she would remove Xiao Bushi's nameplate to wear it on the day of his death. She then apologized to the emperor and said that she would leave the hall because she was not in the mood for it. The emperor was pleased to see many warriors standing out and proclaimed the day a good party. In the Xiao family, Ching Yi's house was a wooden structure for practicing. At this time, Xiao Lan had already occupied this place. Xiao Lan was jumping on the wooden structures while holding a huge boulder on his shoulders. Xiao Ma told Xiao Lan that he was already tired and couldn't hold the boulder anymore. After coming down from the training arena, Xiao Lan said that they would practice after taking a short rest. The brothers were distracted, saying someone had come to check on them behind the Qing Yi building. Xiao Lan was very happy about this. It was Chen Shun, Xiao Lan and Chen Shun immediately hugged each other. They hadn't seen each other for quite a long time and were happy to meet each other. The guy's dialogue was distracted by a subject, he before the leader's request for Xiao Lan to enter the building. Xiao Lan said that he would send someone and Chen Shun would be shown around. But for now, he would see his grandfather. Xiao Lan and a Xiao Bu Shai entered the temple. Grandpa said Qing Di and Xi Ming's son has returned. After thinking for a bit, Xiao Lan asked about the fate of his parents. He had no feelings for them, but he wanted to avenge them. Xiao Bu Shi revealed the truth. Xiao Lan's parents were killed by the Zi Dynasty army. 10,000 men from the Qing Di battalion of the Xiao army were also killed at that time. Xiao Lan asked if they had a spy. Xiao Bu Shi said yes, but he was still investigating the matter and kept quiet about it. The elder added that Xiao Lan could use most of the family's books and pills with his token. Even though Xiao Lan didn't have an imperial token, but he would be rewarded first. Xiao Lan thanked his grandfather and said that he would definitely become stronger with Xiao Dao. Kan Shun rejoiced. He had obtained two advanced speed books and was able to become stronger. 
Shaolan suggested practicing first. He would take a couple of books extra after practicing. My lady Qingyi called Qianxun and Xiaolan inside to have lunch and discuss everything. Qingyi explained how in three days, the emperor would hold a hunting competition. In the meantime, Xiaolan should have practiced with Xiao Dao. Xiaolan asked if they could not go. Qingyi added, about the rule that forced everyone to participate, and it stated that all masters from aristocratic families who had reached the age of 16 must take the fate of the th Qing Yi said that if Xiaolan found a girl on the hunt, she could organize a wedding. Xiaolan refused and didn't want to get married at such a young age. Xiaolan and Xiao Dao heard the creaking of the wood. No one was supposed to be there, and it alerted them. Milady Qing Yi asked the guys to calm down and told the man behind the doors to go inside. Du Gu, the guy's uncle, walked into the room. He was a tall man with long black hair. Ching Yi immediately told the guys to express their greetings towards uncle. The whole three of them folded their hands and saluted. Noticing Xiaolan, Du Gu praised Auntie Ching Yi for the son she had raised well. King Yi asked Xiaolan to go take a shower, for it was not good to be covered in sweat and odor in front of the guests. Already outside, Xiaolan wondered who Du Gu was after all. Qian Shun said he was the modern god of war. Xiao Dou was eager to find out who the god of war was. Qian Shun explained that in the Zhang dynasty, the most famous people in these decades could be distinguished. Apart from Xiao Bu Shi and some unrivaled fighters, there is only one person who is the god of war Xing Du Gu. The four great families are eternal, and the god of war is unbeatable. Simply put, the god of war is one man who can seize the fate of a dynasty. These words shocked the boys. Xiaolan now understood why Du Gu seemed unusual to him. But Xiaolan clearly didn't expect that Auntie knew such people. Du Gu said that he had been looking for his aunt for 17 years. If she didn't want to return to the Xiao family, Qing Yi could go to the northern regions. Du Gu wanted to help her, if he didn't deserve to be her lover. They were at least friends. Qing Yi was unlucky, and she didn't want to involve Du Gu, because the northern border war was very tense. But it was already over, and Qing Yi asked to forget about it, because it didn't matter anymore. Du Gu said that he hadn't gotten married yet, and the reason was known to Qing Yi. He was waiting for her response to marry him. Hearing the pleas for hope, Qing Yi asked Du Gu to wait for just another half a year. Du Gu said he was happy with Qing Yi's answer, and was willing to wait not only six months, but even decades for her sake. Qing Yi didn't understand Du Gu's temper. There were many good girls in the world, and Qing Yi was paralyzed and old. But Du Gu's words struck Qing Yi. He said that although there are many girls in the world, there is only one girl like Qing Yi. Du Gu immediately changed the topic. He revealed that he had found traces of those assassins. Everything pointed to the Black Dragon Court, and he suspected one of the three families was to blame for it. But the exact identities hadn't been found yet. Hearing this, Ching Yi added that it was true due to the power struggle between the four great families. Du Gu asked Ching Yi to keep his mind off it. Once he finished his business in other regions, he would focus on investigating the... Du Gu didn't care who the culprit was. He wanted to turn him into ashes. After which, he told Ching Yi that he was already leaving and asked her to take care of herself. As soon as Du Gu left, Ching Yi burst into tears. She felt that she didn't deserve such an effort from him at all. In the baths, Xiao Dao asked Qian Shun if Du Gu, the god of war, was strong at all because he looked like a normal person. Qian Shun said that the god of war does not rely on martial arts. On the contrary, he uses strategy and intelligence. Xiao Lan swept up. Compared to combat power, in Xiao Lan's opinion, intelligence was much more dangerous. Xiao Dao said that he didn't know much about strategies. But to Xiao Dao's opinion, the black warrior that was beside the god of war was clearly capable, maybe even better than Xiao Futu. Xian Shun remembered the name of the Dugu warrior. His name was Yu Ming. An excellent bodyguard. Someone who was extremely close to the standards of the five most capable people of the dynasty. Standing up, Xiaolan swept the might of the warriors. But the festival was already close. Only three months to go. Xiaolan hoped that they could all rise to the top and the top of the world. Two days later, at the hunting competition in the tents, the guys were changing clothes and apparently preparing for something. Qian Shun walked away from them. Qian Shun came back and held up the red cloak, asking Xiaolan if he really didn't want to wear this to the blind dating contest. Xiaolan refused to wear this attire and said that he would go practice on magical beasts later on. On a rather windy day, the guys were walking to their assigned place. Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao were on donkeys. Along the way, they noticed other disciples. They started mocking the arrogant Xiao Lan, more specifically laughing at his shabby clothes. 
Qianchun didn't like the humiliation from the disciples and asked Xiao Lan's opinion about it. The calm Xiao Lan said to ignore them, after all. He was comfortable, and the opinions of others didn't bother him. Xiao Lan's attention was distracted by the silence of the disciples. They suddenly fell silent after Xiao Lan's words, and it seemed strange. In fact, they were drowned out by the arrival of Xiao Futu, a hell god killer and elder in the Xiao clan's blood hall, ranked fourth in strength in the Xiao clan. Xiao Futu turned to Xiao Lan while asking if Xiao Lan wanted to ride Xiao Futu's vicious wolf. Xiao Lan petted his donkey and said that he didn't need a replacement, as the donkey satisfied his interests in a riding animal. Xiao Futu said that his magic beast wasn't bad, but Xiao Lan should have tried training the beast. Hearing this, all the disciples immediately became envious. They didn't expect that some Xiao Lan had a magical beast. Some of them immediately became Xiao Lan's fans. He was able to take all the attention of the people closest to him. One of Xiao Lan's watchers promised himself that he would regret what he had done and learn a lesson. A loud voice echoed through the forest announcing the imminent start of the hunting competition. They had to make their way to the foot of a nine-star peak. Xiao Lan asked Xiao Futu about the rules of the competition. Xiao Futu said that there were none. They would just be divided into groups. Each group consists of five people, and the hunt will last for three days. Xiao Futu also reminded Xiao Lan of the last tournament he was in because they were very similar in idea. For Xiao Lan, looking for more people to join the group was problematic. He already had a couple of candidates, but three more people were hard to find. The emperor's daughter appeared in the forest. She arrived on a beautiful white-haired horse that emphasized her beauty. Xiao Lan had given up on the idea of inviting her. She was pretty, but it was not a fact that she was strong in combat, and that could cause problems. Xiao Lan decided to score the others. He felt that he had enough of him and Xiao Dao, and the others didn't matter. A group of participants came to the start. A small area surrounded by stone peaks and there was a podium inside. The organizer greeted everyone and said that the start would be an hour in advance. He then explained that the group would receive points for killing spirit beasts. Finally, the man proclaimed the start of the hunting competition and all immediately descended into chaos. Everything was terribly loud, with each student or participant running around looking for a group to join. Xiao Dao wondered why some people were fighting. Xiao Lan explained that it was because some were looking for a group to compete with, and some were looking for a blind date. Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao's conversation was distracted by some lady. She touched Xiao Lan's shoulder, after which she introduced herself. It was He Wanner, a high-level fighter. She wondered if she could join Xiao Lan's team. She wasn't the only one who had distracted Xiao Lan. He Ting Ting had also asked about whether she could join him on the team, clumsily and not at all confidently. Xiao Lan raised his hand and said hello to the girls. Xiao Dao asked if they were going to join the team or if they were here for a date. Xiao Lan silenced him and asked him to be quiet. Xiao Lan ducked his head and said that his main goal was to get as many points as possible in the competition. Fortunately, his words worked on the ladies and they left. This was a relief for Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan's attention was drawn away by another person. It was Cha Mu. He was also interested in Xiao Lan's position on the team. Xiao Lan immediately recognized the person standing in front of him, one of the four young masters in the imperial capital. It was a joy to have such a person on the team. Cha Mu turned to Xiao Lan and told his main objective. He wanted to hunt spiritual beasts. Xiao Dao hugged Cha Mu and said that he liked his jokes. Now there was another person on their team. Hong Do, the Red Bean, approached Xiao Lan as a junior and asked if he wanted to join her team. Xiao Lan corrected the lady, for she had mispronounced his name and added that he was not a boy. Hong Do said that she liked Xiao Lan's disposition, but she decided to get to the point quickly and ask the team question again. Xiao Lan said that it wasn't them joining her but her joining them. She should have kept that in her mind. Cha Mu chuckled behind him. Hong Do turned around and threatened that she would beat him up if he didn't shut up. The group's heated discussions were distracted by someone else. Immediately, everyone was silenced by the person who had disturbed them. It was the Emperor's daughter. She approached Xiao Lan and asked him if she had the honor of joining Xiao Lan's group. Now the others were angry at Xiao Lan. He was able to get the princess on his team and not the others. Xiao Lan thought and said that having the princess on his team would be an honor for him. After which, he extended his hand to her in agreement. The man that wanted to punish Xiao Lan was getting even angrier and asked to call the strongest in his team to make Xiao Lan in trouble. And finally the hunting competition truly began. The teams were assembled and could move out. Xiao Lan and Cha Mu were at the competition for the first time and couldn't pull the team down. They had to give their best. At Xiao Lan's request, Cha Mu showed the way. The group on horseback followed him. 
On their way, the boys spotted a beast. Hongdo immediately recognized the beast and said that it was a white tiger, a third-level supreme spirit beast. Xiao Lan should have hurried over. Xiao Lan asked him to take his time. He wasn't in the mood to fight, but he didn't want to give up either. Xiao Lan suggested finding a gathering with stronger beasts. Xiao Dao said that it was boring. Xiao Lan laughed and corrected him. You should have said boring. The princess suggested going to the fifth peak. There were higher level spirit beasts there. The group made a small pass on the way to the fifth peak. It was already time to move on, but Xiao Lan asked Cha Mu to wait. Hongdo asked her brother Cha Mu what Xiao Lan had intended to do. As it turned out, Xiao Lan was making a trap. Xiao Lan said that the others should have rested better, and he would prepare a trap. The others should prepare for the battle themselves and build up their strength. A disgruntled Hong Do walked up to Xiao Lan and kicked him with her foot. She couldn't sit still and asked if he was going to sit there forever. Xiao Lan asked Hong Do to prepare for battle. They could leave quietly or ask for help in case of anything. Xiao Lan promised that his team would get first place. Hong Do asked not to underestimate her and that she will show her strength later in the fight. Xiao Lan pulled the boys away and said that the beasts were approaching. The whole group prepared to fight and waited for the coming danger. The whole neighborhood of the forest around the boys sounded. The crunching of twigs and leaves, rustles and all sorts of sounds surrounded the boys. Xiao Dao came running over on his donkey and shouted that the beast was on its way. He must have gotten a big catch. The first to emerge from the bushes was a black, scarred wolf. He growled, but the crunching didn't stop. Later, snakes began to come out behind Xiao Lan's back. There were quite a few of them, one by one coming out of the bushes. Suddenly a whole bunch of animals came out of the bushes. From small snakes and tigers to huge tigers and gorillas, a frightened Cha Mu asked how there were so many of them. Zhao Lan laughed and said that it was not many at all. He estimated that there were about 20 beasts. Hong Do thought that Xiao Lan was crazy. Even if he is crazy, she didn't want to be on his side. Xiao Lan saw the beasts getting closer and closer and told the guys to hold their positions. But Xiao Dao decided to gain more ground and shrieked and attacked the white tiger that was beside him. The others also gave some sort of response. Whether by long-range or short-range attacks, Cha Mu slew the dark wolf. The emperor's daughter and Hong Do defeated the big snake. Afterwards, Hong Do reminded her not to underestimate her, but their attention was diverted by Xiao Lan. He had already dealt with all the giant beasts, but not even one, but a bunch of them at once. The fierce Xiao Dao behaved like an animal, running back and forth and slaughtering all sorts of beasts without end. The girls were shocked at the strength of Xiao Dao and Xiao Lan. Just the two of them were able to kill over a dozen beasts with their swordsmanship. Some beast was behind the girls. A knife flew into his chest and was able to save the defenseless ladies. Xiao Lan threw that knife on purpose. He asked the girls to stay focused on the fight. All three members of the group were tired and rested on a rock. Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao shielded their prey. They had gotten more than they expected from the third and fourth level beasts. Cha Mu praised Brother Xiao Lan's plan, but wondered to him how he had managed such a thing in the end. Xiao Lan said that it was quite simple, and explained everything in detail. He put a couple of knives, nails and ropes in the vital intersections, and let Xiao Dao and Xiao Bai lure the beasts in. A joyful Xiao Bao said that the plan was clever and icy. Xiao Lan corrected him again, he should have said easy. But it was only easy for Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao. For others, it was very difficult and painful. The group hostile to Xiao Lan had obtained 15 second level beasts and 5 third level beasts. They believed that Xiao Lan was empty handed. The leader then offered to go up to the fourth peak and their victory was assured. The group continued to gallop off to search for beasts. Cha Mu asked what Xiao Lan's next plans were. He said that after the big hunt, the beasts would be frightened and they should rest now and then continue on afterwards. Chamu also asked about Xiaolan's magical beast. More specifically, whether it was a gift from Xiaolan's relatives. Xiaolan said that he had saved Xiao Bai on the mountain of death, and he was in no way related to his family. Hong Do didn't believe Xiaolan's words and asked him to stop lying. Daring to go to Death Mountain without an awakened soul is suicide. After all, Death Mountain is the most dangerous region of the Zhang dynasty. Xiaolan didn't care about Hong Do's opinion. It was her business to believe it or not, so he just chalked it up to that. In addition, Hong Do complimented Xiao Lan's flirting ability at his young age. Xiao Lan said that he didn't like little girls, but rather big girls like Hong Do. He used the metaphor to give another compliment to Hong Do. Hong Do got angry and pulled Xiao Lan's hair and told him to watch his words. The rest of the group laughed with the situation between Hong Do and Xiao Lan. The joke was deliciously funny. 
and her reaction added to the laughter. Soon the group arrived at the place where they wanted to spend the coming night. It was a small place in the forest that descended into a clearing. Chamu swept up. Unfortunately, their spot was already taken by some group in front of them. Shaolan had another option of where to go. Shaolan suggested entering the nearest cave where it was just as comfortable. The princess said that there was no need for Xiaolan's plan, and by some miracle, materials appeared beside her. It was all the effect of her ring. It was some kind of otherworldly vault. The name of the ring was Sumitabi, a magical spatial ring. It was very convenient as you could store many things in it. The princess asked Xiaolan what his title of this ring meant. He dismissed it as just an item from Xiao's village. With the materials obtained, the group was able to build a fire and make a tent. Later, Everyone sat quietly around the fire. Chamu gave his opinion about the meat made by Xiaolan. It was delicious, and Chamu wanted to know the recipe. Xiaolan laughed and said that he just had a lot of outdoor survival skills. Xiaolan also turned to the girls and asked how they liked the meat, but he noticed that they had already eaten everything. Chamu observed that the meat made by Xiaolan attracted both women and men. The tent next to Xiaolan's group was young Master Zuo's group spot. He already hated the sight of Xiaolan. Soon, Master Zuo snapped and challenged Xiao Lan to a duel if he wasn't afraid to fight him. Xiao Lan thought it was a good opportunity to stretch out a bit after a hearty meal. Chamu pulled Master Zuo away and began to explain that Xiao Lan hadn't awakened his soul yet, and it was worth waiting for the soul festival for a fair duel. Master Zuo said that he just might not use his soul. In the last fight, he behaved frivolously. Xiao Lan asked Master Zuo not to hold back his soul power. He could use it as much as he wanted to. Xiao Lan said that he wanted to know what kind of soul Master Zuo possessed. Was it really related to chickens? The joke was a good one, and everyone laughed, except that Master Zuo was even angrier than before. Master Zuo awakened the soul called Enlightenment, and a fiery aura enveloped him in a circle. Xiao Lan noticed Master Zuo's spirit. It was a spirit of speed. Such a spirit would bring a bit of trouble to Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan was immediately surprised. Master Zuo disappeared from his sight and was behind him in the blink of an eye. Managing to react, Xiaolan threw his knife and forced Master Zuo to retreat slightly, but the knife didn't hit either. Master Zuo was literally vaporized by the knife flying at him. Xiaolan was able to figure out the next place where Master Zuo would be, and threw another knife there. But just like the first time, the knife just flew through Master Zuo and he vaporized, leaving a yellow mark. Xiaolan turned around once again and noticed Master Zuo flying at him to make a kicking motion. Xiaolan jumped back, leaving a trail of grass behind him. Thankfully, he had enough reaction to dodge it. Master Zuo and Xiao Lan were rushing from side to side during the battle. Master Zuo's subjects watched the entire fight. They shouted that Xiao Lan was almost exhausted and motivated Master Zuo in every way possible. Hongdo asked Cha Mu to stop the fight because Xiao Lan was already at his limit and Master Zuo wanted to kill him. The princess was also excited, and Xiao Dao laughed calling the two fighting fools. Master Zuo noticed how Xiao Lan's speed had noticeably decreased and he could easily finish him off. Master Zuo hit Xiao Lan thinking that he had pierced his body with his hand through his body in hopes of killing Xiao Lan. Except Master Zuo grabbed Xiao Lan's clothes instead of piercing him through. It was quite strange. This time, Xiao Lan himself was behind Master Zuo's back, after which Xiao Lan said that Master Zuo had lost this fight. Immediately after his words, Xiao Lan waved his hand and made a punch that carried with it an explosion. Master Zuo fell to the ground and started coughing up blood. Apparently, Xiao Lan had won the duel between them for the second time already. The subjects ran up to Master Zuo and said that Xiao Lan was insolent because Master Zuo would never do such a thing. Xiao Lan said that he had no intention of killing Master Zuo and asked his subjects to send word to Master Zuo so that later he would personally approach Xiao Lan to admit defeat. Xiao Lan returned to the group and Master Zuo's subjects dispersed with them taking their master in addition to them. Hongdo ran up to Xiao Lan and began to ask about what had happened. Xiao Lan had miraculously become faster than Master Zuo. Xiao Lan called it a strategy, and that was all. But also, Xiao Lan was sure that Master Zuo had personally noticed his strike. Chamu understood Xiao Lan's strategy. Ming Zuo was just tricked, Lan Xiao was slower, so Xiao Lan purposely slowed down and made a moulage. Xiao Lan said that he was the son of a nobleman, someone like him did not have much battle experience. Hongdo sighed, and after what she had seen, she finally believed Xiao Lan's stories of the Mountain of Death. Xiao Lan caught Hongdo's eye at her words and remarked that just like those stories, so was his love for big girls. Hongdo got embarrassed again and slapped Xiao Lan right in the face to make him stop complimenting her. Hongdo started running after Xiao Lan and hitting him in every way possible. 
the group just laughed as they fought again. Deep in the night after the battle between Shaolan's group and Master Zuo's group, the action moved to a large tent. There was a man walking in the middle of the tent. He was agitated and walked from side to side back and forth. Another man came out from the other side of the tent. He was white-haired, and his coming out clearly interested the first man. The man asked the elder about Master Zuo's condition. The white-haired elder said that he would not die, but he had brought much shame to the man. The man sighed heavily and didn't understand how Master Zuo got a slap on the head from Xiao Lan every time. Xiao Futu started laughing loudly, which distracted and even partially frightened the subjects beside him. Xiao Lan really didn't dishonor the Xiao family. From the occasion of Xiao Lan's fight, Xiao Futu and his group will drink L and celebrate. Xiao Futu really hadn't misjudged Xiao Lan. He was worried for nothing, and after all, Xiao Lan's talent was unfathomable. Early in the morning, Cha Mu woke up. He woke up very sleepy and didn't understand what was going on. The first thing Cha Mu saw was Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao carrying huge boulders on their backs. Hongdo told Cha Mu, saying breakfast was already ready and Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao had woken up early. It became clear to Hongdo that Xiao Lan's victory over Master Zuo was not a coincidence at all. Xiao Lan possessed brains and justified it with his hard work. Even in this situation, he practiced. Later, Hong Do and Xiao Lan rode on horses. Hong Do acknowledged her respect towards Xiao Lan and his strength. Xiao Lan was happy about this news, but he wouldn't stop calling Hong Do Big Sis. The rest of the group continued to watch Hong Do chase after Xiao Lan in a fit of confusion and rage. Cha Mu wondered to the princess. Why on earth did she join Xiao Lan's group after all? Everyone here is so noisy. Cha Mu realized that the princess might look harmless on the outside, but he feared that she was more insidious than all of them. Xiao Dao rushed through Cha Mu and the princess. Xiao Lan asked Xiao Dao to be quicker. Cha Mu also wanted to come to the scene of the incident and find out what could have happened so badly. Xiao Lan's group found an armored lizard, a fourth level spirit beast. Hong Dou was afraid of this beast. She didn't think that their strength was even close compared to this monster. Xiao Lan asked how many points they would get for this beast. Cha Mu said that in three years, no group could beat it and the currency is not known. Cha Mu added, if they defeat this monster, the competition might end before the scheduled time. Xiao Lan was extremely motivated by what he heard, and without thinking long, he decided to defeat this thing. As the lizard approached the group, it was bigger, almost three times the size of a normal human being. Xiao Lan said that Xiao Dao and him would be the front line of attack, and the others should listen to his commands. Xiao Dao used his reincarnation ability and immediately doubled in size, strengthening himself. After which, Xiao Dao started pelting the lizard with all sorts of punches all over the lizard's body. Hong Dou offered to help Xiao Dao in the mess, but Cha Mu said they should wait because they could have made more trouble for Xiao Dao. The armored lizard's defense was too strong. Even though the guy's attacks were aimed at one point, it didn't do any damage to it. The princess distracted the boys and said that wasn't the case at all and asked to see the lizard. Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao attacked for a reason. The scales on the lizard's belly began to weaken. Hong Do admired Xiao Lan more and more. His strength and strategies were truly marvelous. Hong Do's attention was diverted by a blow to Xiao Lan. The lizard was able to hit Xiao Lan with its tail. Cha Mu asked Xiao Lan if they should have retreated temporarily, since Xiao Lan was holding on weakly. But Xiao Lan didn't plan to give up so quickly, as the show was just beginning. Xiao Lan jumped into the air and threw the knife at the face of the lizard man in front of him. The knife hit right next to her eye and the lizard was temporarily blinded due to the cuts. Xiao Lan grabbed his knife and with a jerk, inflicted several cuts on one of the lizard's legs. Xiao Dou at this moment started beating the lizard's body. His blows felt as if they were digging into its skin. Pain rushed throughout the lizard's entire body. The blows came from every point on her body, whether it was her leg or her body. Xiao Lan gave a command to his allies. Hong Dou, Cha Mu, and the princess were to use their soul combat abilities and attack the lizard in the belly. A white aura was emanating from Hong Do's bow. She drew the arrow and was about to fire it. The shot hit right into the lizard's stomach. The shot was clear and strong. Xiao Lan's strategy must have worked. The lizard fell to the ground and rolled over onto its back, already apparently unconscious. Xiao Lan fell to the ground and said with a heavy sigh that it was very close. But fortunately, his plan had come to fruition. Hong Do asked why Xiao Lan was so reckless. After all, the lizard could have killed him. Xiao Lan praised Hong Do's shot and asked her to help him with the ointment after the fight. Hong Do asked why Xiao Lan was trying so hard, he could have asked for help much earlier. Cha Chu explained that if someone asks for help all their life, when that person gets into trouble with the cost of their life, 
it won't feel like you're on the edge of life and death, much less instincts. Furthermore, Charong realized that the Xiao clan could protect Xiao Lan. But in order for Xiao Lan's strength to grow, he needed to be in bloody battles himself. Xiao Lan hugged Cha Ru and said that the latter knew him very well and being friends with him was quite nice. Hongdo snorted and said that she would go see the state of the spiritual beast lizard beast after being hit. Xiao Lan suggested that Cha Mu should also go with Hongdo and check the condition of the armored lizard. Hongdo asked Xiao Lan if he had fought such lizards before, for he was quite confident. Xiao Lan said no and Hongdo was quite surprised. She didn't understand how he could be so confident. The princess intervened in the dialogue and said that Xiao Lan had always fought spirit beasts and could judiciously assess his capabilities. Xiao Lan picked up on the princess's hunch. Unless he was forever bordering on death and life, he wouldn't be able to eat and sleep well. Hongdo said that Xiao Lan would pass the border once and kill herself that way. Xiao Lan asked Hongdo to remain a widow for the rest of his life, even if he died. Charong sighed heavily and remarked what a lecherous guy Xiao Lan was after all. Charong took out a small lens. When he looked at it, he knew that they did not need to set up a new camp, but simply return to the base of operations. Back Xiao Lan found Xiao Futu and immediately turned to Xiao Futu before he even had a chance to unpack his belongings. Xiao Futu swept up Xiao Lan's early return, according to him, he must have prepared well. Xiao Lan agreed with Xiao Futu and opened the bag, from which coins immediately sprinkled out. A whole pile of coins as big as half of Xiao Lan's height was in that bag. Xiao Futu laughed out loud at what he saw. Xiao Futu stopped laughing and said that victory was not far at all, but Xiao Lan should not relax. Today, Xiao Futu would not punish Xiao Lan. Only from now on, when Xiao Lan fought, the tone should not be given the slightest edge. Xiao Lan gladly accepted Xiao Futu's advice and thanked Xiao Futu for his teachings. Xiao Futu turned to his soldiers and said as they continued to celebrate. Master Zuo finally woke up and couldn't believe what he had heard. Xiao Lan's group had returned earlier and was even able to kill the armored lizard. The man reassured Master Zuo and conditioned it on the fact that Xiao Lan was used to being in the mountains. After Master Zuo returned, everyone in his clan would be trained by him. Master Zuo was getting angrier and angrier. He swore to himself that he would kill Xiao Lan with all his strength. Xiao Lan sat by the fire with a group of Xiao Futu's subjects. One of the warriors asked why Xiao Lan had chosen Xiao Futu's group over the beautiful girls in his group. Xiao Lan said that he was used to drinking with guys and he had more freedom there. Besides, who could Xiao Lan look at? The warriors said they were, and everyone laughed amicably. The group was quite amused and comfortable. Some guests started heading towards Xiao Futu's group. There were quite a few of them, even very many. One of the warriors told Xiao Lan about the warriors that were coming towards them and swept up a large number of them. When each of the warriors heard the impending guests, they all turned around and were immediately shocked. Two of the group of people who came approached Xiao Lan and wanted to say something to him. The two men ducked their heads and said that Princess Zishan and Lady Hongdo had asked to come to them. The warriors were supporting Xiao Lan. Supposedly, he was honored to receive an invitation from such orderly ladies. Xiao Lan hesitated and was asked who he would choose after all. Princess Zishan or Lady Hongdo? Putting the cup on the ground, Xiao Lan said let Zishan and Hongdo come to him by themselves. You see, Xiao Lan had no time for these girls at all, and they must come on their own. Everyone was shocked by Xiao Lan's words. How could Xiao Lan treat women like that? The warrior told Xiao Lan that this was not the way to treat the ladies, and should have gone after them. Xiao Lan said that he didn't want to choose one of them. Besides, they were too gentle for him. Xiao Lan was yelled at. When he turned around, he noticed two girls looking directly at him. They were displeased at Xiao Lan's words. Xiao Lan could protect Xiao Lan in any situation except for the problems with women, then that was already personally his problem. The warriors immediately stood up. They are like rude men, immediately leave the place and let the women be with Xiao Lan. The frightened Xiao Lan asked the guys not to leave. He asked them to wait and linger for just a little bit. As soon as Xiao Lan smelled the presence of the woman behind him, he was terrified for his life even more. Hongdo shouted at Xiao Lan and asked him to at least respect the orderly ladies. How were they supposed to behave after Xiao Lan's disrespect? Xiao Lan agreed. But he didn't understand why the women had come to him. Apart from the few still on the mountain, the rest had already returned. Hong Do said that it wasn't fun at all. There were no strong ones at all. Xiao Lan didn't understand what strong people were talking about and asked Hong Do to tell more about it. The princess asked Xiao Lan about the emperor's sons. Did Xiao Lan think everyone was so weak? After all, Xiao Lan had only humiliated Zuomin a couple of times. 
but not all sons were like that. Xiulan waved his hands and insisted that he really wanted to know about the Emperor's strong sons. Hongdo said that Mingzhou is really weak, but his brother Jianzuo has more ability. And of course Hongdo's cousin, Dongfang Aozhan Estate, who guards the northern district. From their generation, the firstborn of the Ni family, Ni Kang and Xiao Moshen, the best of the best in the Xiao family. All of them are fighting in the northern region while the guys are chatting. Xiao Lan observed that they were really strong once they were on the battlefield. They didn't have time to weave intrigue. Someday, Xiao Lan also wanted to join the military and go to the battlefield. Hongdo had pleased Xiao Lan. All he needed to do was to awaken his divine soul at the Soul Festival and he would immediately become the leader of the group. Even Princess Zishan said that she was looking forward to Shaolan wowing the world during the Soul Festival. At the end of the competition, the winners were announced. Shaolan was in first place, and Ming Zuo was in second place. Cha Ru rejoiced at his victory in the competition, but Shaolan wasn't surprised at anything there. He had already expected to win. Now Cha Rong and Shaolan will go back for the prize, and once everything is settled, they will find each other. Later, there was a loud quarrel in the Xiao mansion, or rather the elder's courtyard. Xiao Bu Xi was very angry. Xiao Bu Xi threw the papers on the ground and asked the others how come in a long time they couldn't find the Black Dragon Society's hideout. One of the humiliation listeners asked the Lord to calm down, because after Lord Xiao Bu Xi returned, they issued an order to investigate Qing Di's assassination. The problem was that every time they found a clue about Black Dragons, it was immediately dropped, or the witness died. Hence, according to the initial guess, it could be more important people in the imperial court, or maybe one of the three pretenders. This alarmed Xiao Bu Shi. Xiao Bu Shi called Xiao Futu to him. He immediately came over, and Xiao Bu Shi said that whether it was the imperial court or the challengers, from this day onwards, they must give their best. Xiao Bu Shi gave Xiao Futu the authority to deploy all of the clan's forces, for the sake of destroying the Black Dragon Society and those pulling the strings for the murder of his son and the death of the 10,000 Iron Riders. Xiao Bu Shi was determined to take revenge. In the Xiao family home, Xiao Lan was meditating and radiating electrical energy from himself. Xiao Lan's meditation was distracted by an auntie coming in. Xiao Dao and Xiao Lan immediately stood up and greeted her. Auntie recommended that the boys work harder, as there had already been a shower festival in two months. Awakening the soul is very important for a martial artist on the spiritual ground. A soul awakening will improve one's cultivation progress at least once. A one-year cultivation will be equal to a two-year cultivation of a normal practitioner. The boys should have imagined how good a soul was for a martial arts master. They understood Auntie and agreed with her. Auntie Ching Yi added that an ordinary awakened soul would show up with their martial skills. Of course, there have been both good and bad ones. However, higher level souls tend to come with good combat skills, for example, the roar of the raging lion of the eighth master. Historically, the probability of awakening strong souls is much higher for prodigies. Theoretically, the greater the skill of a martial practitioner, the greater the chance that he or she will awaken a better soul. Shaolan understood Anti Ching Yi's motives and clenched his kulan, promising to try much harder for the sake of it. The crackling of the trees distracted Shaolan. Apparently, there was someone in the tree and was watching them. It was Qian Shun. He had come to boast that he was finally able to reach the martial sensor phase. Xiao Lan's eyes lit up with surprise. He took Qian Shun by the shoulders and asked if it was true while getting more and more surprised. Auntie Ching Yi noticed how happy Xiao Lan was and allowed him to rest for a while. When Qian Shun gasped at his clan's secret technique, he could raise his speed even more. Even if Huo Feng level masters were around, Qian Shun would be able to protect Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan laughed. After all, Qian Shun is always afraid of being hunted by someone. But Xiao Lan was also getting stronger all this time. Xiao Lan hoped that he too could awaken a speed-type divine spirit just like Qian Shun. Qian Shun believed that Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao would be able to awaken a higher divine soul than him. The guys agreed with Qian Shun's opinion and agreed to do their best for the sake of it. Xiao Lan came to see his grandfather. He said it was not necessary to bow before him and asked Xiao Lan to sit down. Grandpa had heard that Xiao Lan and Xiao Dao had been practicing manically lately. At all, Grandpa began to ask about Xiao Lan's life. Xiao Bu Shi asked if Xiao Lan could become a mid-level general before the Soul Festival. Xiao Lan said that it was quite possible. Xiao Bu Shi added that Xiao Lan's father should have been the master of this house, but unfortunately he is not around. After Xiao Lan's soul awakens, Xiao Bu Shi intends to make a young patriarch out of him. 
Shaolan was surprised by his grandfather's words. He didn't think he was competent for such a title as young patriarch. But grandfather said that out of everyone there, only Shaolan was the best candidate for such a role. Grandpa added that from the next day, Shaolan would go to the war hall to meet the others. Shaolan said that he was not a particularly sociable person, and this plan was not the best plan. Grandpa said that Shaolan could argue all he wanted, but Xiaobu Shi believed in Shaolan's kindness. Although uncertain, Xiaolan was able to agree to his grandfather's beliefs about tomorrow. Qin Shun, Xiaolan, and Xiaodao were walking through the city on a clear day. The crowd surrounded them and interacted with the guys in every way possible. Some people welcomed Xiaolan, while others asked whether or not the young master had come to the city for the sake of cultivation. Xiaolan agreed and said that he would study among all the others from now onwards. Lots of girls liked Xiaolan's image and called him handsome and complimented him on it. Elder Xiao Qing Hu watched Xiaolan and was furious. He didn't understand why the clan leader wanted to elevate him. In the war hall, Xiao Qing Hu was starting to practice refining. One had to take an iron weight and run around in a circle. Xiao Qing Hu asked Xiaolan to take the lightest load since he was only on his first day of martial practice. Xiaolan laughed and said that he liked to make himself assignments, and it wasn't a problem. Xiaolan was able to take the heaviest load without effort and surprised everyone. Even Xiao Qing Hu was angry at what he saw. Some of the disciples had studied for as long as three years, but they hadn't even touched the heaviest weight, and Xiaolan had taken it without any difficulty. Xiao Qinghu called out to his disciples, Xiao Ye and Xiao Hor. They immediately came to Master's call. Since they were resting yesterday, Xiao Qinghu would punish them by giving another extra training session to the guys. After the instructions, all the students began carrying all sorts of loads, from the smallest that walked behind to the huge ones. Xiao King Hu was confident that Xiao Lan would give up at 10 laps, when Xiao Ye and Xiao Hua could walk more than 30 laps. After many laps, almost all students with extremely small weights are already exhausted. But Xiao Lan had already held on for the 30th lap, and he also had the heaviest load on his shoulders. Xiao Qing Hu couldn't believe his eyes. For 30 laps, Xiao Lan had already been walking calmly and looked like he didn't give a damn. Master Xiao Qing Hu was now only relying on Xiao Ye, hoping that he could defeat Xiao Lan in endurance. Xiao Yi spoke to Xiao Lan and proposed a wager on who would last longer. The loser would be the lackey of the other. Xiao Lan said to forget about the lackey thing, but agreed to the match without any problems. Xiao Lan and Xiao Ye had already missed each other and started walking at an extremely fast speed. They already had more than 70 laps on their account. The disciples had almost lost count of the laps that Xiao Lan and Xiao Ye had walked. Almost all of their thoughts were filled with amazement at Xiao Lan's strength. Xiao Qing Hu could only open his mouth and be shocked. It's already been 80 laps and both of them are still as easy as ever. Xiao Ye couldn't believe what was happening. Xiao Lan was only a brat, but he was somehow winning. With his last strength, Xiao Ye tried to hold on to his weight and kept walking, but soon he couldn't stand it and fell down. Xiao Ye's strength ran out, and he finally fell to the ground powerlessly, leaving himself as a loser in front of Xiao Lan. Xiao Qing Hu immediately ran over and grabbed Xiao Ye asking about his condition hoping that he was fine. Xiao Ye fainted. Even Xiao Zilan noticing this began to worry about Xiao Ye's condition. Taking Xiao Ye in his arms, Xiao Qing Hu ordered his disciples to cultivate without his participation for the moment. The students praised Xiao Lan, for he had broken the record and offered water as a token of victory. The girls also respected Xiao Lan. He was terribly gentle in their eyes and was able to vent their hatred for Xiao Ye. Xiao Lan was offered a drink with the girls tonight, but he declined, laughing in response. Hearing the door creak, Xiaolan turned around and noticed some guy. His aura was not at all different from the others. His name was Xiao Mo Shen, and he was 21 years old, and his soul was at the peak of the heavenly level. The wolf of the great wilderness. This is a very strong spirit of attacking style. Xiao Mo Shen really was different from the other disciples. Imperial City was full of talents, but Xiaolan felt like he was about to fight Xiao Mo Shen, and it was quite interesting. Xiao Moshin just walked through Xiao Lan. Xiao Lan thought it was kind of weird. Suddenly Xiao Qing Hu pulled Xiao Lan away. He and Xiao Ye returned. Xiao Qing Hu was telling the disciples to prepare to practice movements. Teams of two depending on the level would fight each other. And harming the opponent was forbidden. The disciples were afraid to fight Xiao Lan. He might be weak, but his experience in battle was truly terrifying. Xiao King Hu noticed Xiao Lan's fighting ability and suggested that Xiao Lan train with Xiao Ye and Xiao Hor at the same time. Xiao Lan agreed but was afraid and asked if Xiao Ye should have rested a little more after that race. Xiao Ye thanked brother Xiao Lan for his concern and suggested that he move on to training faster. 
Xiao Lan was warming up a bit before the fight. Already everyone was ready. Xiao Ye and Xiao Hoer versus Xiao Lan. As soon as Xiao Lan said that it was a great honor for him, Xiao Ye rushed into battle. Xiao Lan jumped high into the air to easily dodge Xiao Ye's punch. Xiao Hoer asked his brother to give him a try, and immediately jumped into the air directly towards Xiao Lan. Xiao Hoer ended up jumping even higher than Xiao Lan himself. Apparently this was Xiao Hoer's plan. After which, Xiao Hoer made a punch, but it was unsuccessful. Xiao Lan just dodged. Xiao Hoer couldn't believe his eyes. How was it humanly possible to dodge in the air like that? After which, Xiao Lan landed already on the ground, still leaving the brothers shocked. Still, Xiao Ye and Xiao Hoer were quite difficult opponents as Xiao Lan saw it. Trinity returned to the same position from which the fight between them had started in the first place. Xiao Ye and Xiao Hoer got angry, and both of them decided to strike, thinking that Xiao Lan wouldn't dodge it. Just as they thought, Xiao Lan didn't dodge but was able to block their blows quite easily. Xiao Lan continued to block Xiao Ye and Xiao Hoer's excellent combo, blow after blow after blow. It looked like the elder wanted to kill Xiao Lan, because it was almost impossible to hold back the onslaught of Xiao Ye and Xiao Hoer's combos. Xiao Lan had noticed how good the boys' combos were. There was a reason Xiao Qing Hu had taken them to train with Xiao Lan, except that they were too weak for him. After which, Xiao Lan tossed the stone slab into the air. Xiao Lan used this slab as a shield to block the guy's combo even better. Xiao Ye asked Xiao Lan to stop trying since he would never win their duo. After saying those words, Xiao Ye smashed the stone slab that Xiao Lan was defending so well with. The smug Xiao Ye already thought that Xiao Lan was finished and this would be a victory for him. But, not here. Xiao Lan began to dodge Xiao Ye's punches without any difficulty. After a few dodges it came to Xiao Hoer. He found himself behind Xiao Lan who dodged another punch. Suddenly Xiao Ye hit his brother Xiao Hoer right in the face when he wished to hit Xiao Lan. As soon as he was distracted by his brother, Xiao Lan threw a piece of stone directly at Xiao Ye and he did it quite forcefully. Xiao Ye flew off, letting a small trail of blood trail behind him. After all, the stone had hit him perfectly. It was a sight to behold. The two beaten brothers were lying on the ground and Xiao Lan was standing over them cheering his victory. Xiao Qing Hu immediately noticed the outcome of the fight and ran to Xiao Ye again inquiring about his condition. Xiao Ye did not respond to Xiao Qing Hu's words. In anger, he turned on Xiao Lan and accused him of what he had done. Xiao Lan apologized to the master and told him to exclude him from future fights, then said that he would be leaving immediately. After humiliating almost everyone in the military training, Xiao Lan simply left this place. It was quite easy. Already in the evening, Xiao Lan was having an evening meal with great appetite, as was Xiao Dao sitting beside him. Auntie Ching Yi had noticed that Xiao Lan didn't really suit places with the presence of groups. Xiao Lan apologized for supposedly everyone there was too weak, and he had overreacted a little too much. Ching Yi said that it was fine. After all, if he was around trash, he would become like this. It was better to train himself. A messenger interrupted Xiao Lan's meal. He came to deliver a letter of invitation to Xiao Lan. The letter mentioned a banquet at the Moon Inn that was coming up in 10 days, and Xiao Lan would be welcome there. The invitation was from Princess Zishan. All talented people were invited, and those who dared to decline the invitation would be stolen and personally delivered to the banquet. Xiao Lan didn't want to go to the place with the poems and asked Xiao Dao to go instead. Xiao Dao said that even through his death, he would not go there. Auntie Ching Yi chuckled at the invitation to the poetry banquet and decided to explain what it was in more detail. It was said that in ancient times, art and poetry flourished on the mainland. On the contrary, few practiced martial arts. Hence, many wanted to write beautiful poetry. It was only after an inexplicable change that the practice of martial arts took the lead. As people collected ancient poetic writings from various personal ruins over the years, poetry became more popularized. King Yi asked Xiao Lan not to belittle the sons and daughters of aristocrats in the imperial city. Many of them are talented in the arts. Back in the day, it was Xiao Lan's father who excelled in both poetry and martial arts. Qing Yi asked Xiao Lan if he was afraid and laughed. The frightened Xiao Lan immediately began to deny and said that he was not afraid of anything. Qing Yi added that Xiao Lan is popular. Yi had the honor of being invited by the national beauty and high-level general at 17 years old, Princess Zishan. Xiao Lan was becoming more and more afraid. Qing Yi started asking his opinion of her and even wanted to betroth them both. Xiao Lan didn't hold back and said that it wasn't worth it at all to enlist them together. He didn't want to. In the end, Xiao Lan still came to the banquet, even though he was very much afraid of poetry. The guard turned to Xiao Lan immediately recognizing him. He explained that it was still a little early, but some guests had already arrived. 
The princess wasn't there yet, but Xiaolan could enter the other guests or could stroll in the garden. Xiaolan chose to walk in the garden. He felt good alone and asked the guard not to go along with him. Xiaolan immediately forgot about the garden. He was very hungry and couldn't wait for an hour for food to be served willfully. After a short search through the corridors, Xiaolan was able to find the cherished treasure he had been searching so frantically for. Food. After entering the food hall, Xiaolan was about to caress his stomach with delicious food, when suddenly he heard some voice. After listening to him for a bit, Xiaolan recognized who it was. It was Hong Do. He didn't know why Hong Do was here. But Xiao Lan decided to scare her and make a mean joke on Hong Do now that the opportunity had arisen. He quietly tiptoed toward her room and was about to yank it to frighten Hong Do. Opening the curtain, Xiao Lan saw Hong Do without any clothes at all and only covering herself with a towel. She screamed that Xiao Lan was a filthy pervert and said what a shameless man he was and how dare he gawk at her. Xiao Lan started apologizing for this misunderstanding, saying that it was an accident and at all he was looking for food. Hong Do immediately slapped Xiao Lan. She didn't want to listen to his excuses at all and insisted on her opinion. Xiao Lan ran away and apologized while she continued to wish him dead in every way possible attacking him. Falling to the ground, Xiao Lan asked Hong Do to calm down so as not to attract other people's attention. Miss Hong Do fell to her knees and began to cry at what Xiao Lan had done. He felt even more ashamed of his deed. Xiao Lan was wondering what he should do. If it was the old days, he would be forced to marry her, but he still had Liu Ya. Xiao Lan continued to apologize and said that all the responsibility was on him. After all, he was completely at fault. Without listening to him to the end, Hong Do simply ran away from him in tears. Xiao Lan was broken. An assistant came into the room and reported that the princess was waiting for Xiao Lan in the front hall. Xiao Lan found himself in a Diwali large hall. There were tables on all sides and many guests behind them. Fortunately, there was no Hongdo in this room, for Xiao Lan would have been terribly embarrassed in front of her. The aristocrats mocked Xiao Lan about his illiteracy, for he obviously did not know any poems. Xiao Lan also realized that among these people, he didn't fit into the picture particularly well. Xiao Lan and the others' attention was distracted by the princess. She finally came into the banquet hall. Zishen reminded about the culture of Jiang Dynasty. There is no separation between creativity and martial arts so the Jiang Dynasty greatly values the study of both. This banquet is arranged so that the future generation can show and exchange knowledge. Yu Zhou stood up and asked the princess if he could recount his poem about his excursion on Mount Bulao. The princess agreed and asked him to speak. The poem was at all beautifully able to describe the sights and feelings from Mount Bulao. Other authors have praised Yu Zhou's poem. One author remarked on the beauty of the poem and its ability to describe the experience on the mountain. He admired Yu Zhou's abilities. Each of the authors constantly praised Yu Zhou, telling of the beauty of his eloquent poetry. And after that, everyone began to want to tell their poem, dozens of voices crowding the hall. Brother Cha Mu was also here. He wanted to talk about the poem he had personally written, about one woman's smile. After rising, Cha Mu recounted his poem and very beautifully described the beauty of the lady to whom he dedicated this verse. Immediately, criticism fell upon it. In the opinion of the authors, the poem was good, but it lacked elegance. Out of all the voices, Xiao Lan's loud voice rang out. He picked up on Cha Mu's straightforwardness and said how good his verse was. Xiao Lan said, How could he not be particularly popular among the writers? But that girl who will get this poem from Cha Mu is surely the happiest. And if she dares to refuse, she will be forcibly brought to Cha Mu's house. These words not only shocked everyone, other authors found it rude and insolent. Chamu knew that Xiaolan was straightforward, but there was no way he could have expected such words from him. Still, Chamu smiled and expressed his gratitude at the compliments about his poetry. Lady of Zuo family, Zuo Xi spoke up. She wanted to see the poetry of Lady Qing Yi's popular nephew, Lady Qing Yi that was a good author. Xiaolan stood up and said that he only knew how to kill and was not known for elegance. So he asked Zuo Xi to express his poetry in his place. They were interrupted by the Nie family's late master, Kang Ni. He was all dressed in greenish clothes. Princess Zishan was delighted at his appearance, and as a punishment she told him to drink three bowls of wine. Tsang Ni didn't mind. It was a fitting punishment for his long tardiness. Xiao Lan saw boundless magnanimity in Cheng Ni. But he didn't understand why there was murderous intent coming from Cheng Ni behind him. Turns out it was Hong Do who wanted to kill Xiao Lan. She was terribly evil. Tsang Ni was asked to compose a poem, for there were wonderful rumors about him about his eloquence. Within a minute, Tsang Ni composed a short poem for the willing authors. It was short but beautiful. 
Cha Mu and a host of other authors expressed their appreciation and honors towards Chang Ni's poem. While everyone was distracted by the poems, Xiaolan wanted to run away. Only Hong Do noticed this and asked him to wait for him. Xiaolan said that he only wanted to visit the restroom, and Hong Do's opinion was wrong. Princess Zishan asked Hong Do if there was any problem between her and Xiaolan. If so, she would solve everything. Xiaolan apologized to Hong Do again and asked for a light punishment like cups of wine. Hong Do said that she wouldn't let him go so easily. Only when Xiaolan tells three worthy poems will he be free. For Xiaolan, this task was almost impossible. Other authors also scoffed at him. Xiaolan set conditions. He will fulfill it. But if Miss Hong Do doesn't like the poem, he will stab himself with a knife. Others thought it was a reckless decision. It was reckless indeed. Hong Do accepted his terms. She wanted to see how good Xiaolan was at this topic. Stepping into the center, Xiaolan asked Cha Mu to toss him a cup of wine before telling him the story. Xiaolan grabbed the green wine cup on the fly and was already ready for his stories. After which, he drank it in a volley in front of everyone and was now fully prepared, having considered all steps. And without thinking long, he began to speak his poetry. The poem was about a night drinking without a friend, in the lonely silence of a dead night. Even Princess Zishan saw Xiaolan's potential and creativity from one poem, he said. Once Xiaolan started his second story, the listeners liked it more and more. Others might not have respected him as a person, but they couldn't believe their ears. Xiaolan's poetry was beautiful. After finishing his second marvelous story, Xiaolan looked at Hong Do and saw her confused look. Again, without thinking long, Xiaolan began his third and final story. His third poem was short but most beautiful. No one in this hall had ever heard such beautiful poetry about love before, Xiaolan said. After finishing his stories, Xiaolan apologized and decided to seclude himself in the bathroom. After all, he had finally fulfilled the conditions. No one understood how someone like Xiaolan possessed such poems. It was some kind of miracle. Qian Ni was ashamed of himself. Xiaolan was the peak of talent. Qian Ni shouldn't have written any more poetry. Zizhan asked the embarrassed Hong Do whether the last love poem was dedicated to her or not. Hong Do couldn't finish speaking and mumbled something to herself as she tried to gather her thoughts together. The embarrassed Hong Do couldn't stand it after all and ran out of the hall. Xiaolan's poems were too much for her liking. Later, Xiaolan was at home in front of Auntie Ching Yi and Grandpa Xiaobu Shi and was recounting what had happened. Xiaolan thought about whether to tell about the incident with Hong Do, but changed his mind when Ching Yi spoke for literature. But Xiaolan was confused about how Auntie knew about his poetry after all, since he had just returned. As it turned out, the entire imperial city was already confused. Everyone was talking about Xiaolan's genius surpassing history. Xiaolan's name went through the entire imperial city. The Xiao family's progenitor had received every title, except scholar. Xiaolan, however, was the only one who deserved it. Xiao Bu Shi laughed and swept up Xiaolan's brilliance. He was able to scare all the old men so easily. Xiaolan said that he would no longer write poems even though he would be killed. He wanted to practice martial arts, and only Grandfather told Xiaolan to forget about the war room. Xiaolan now needed to focus on cultivating in the Qing Yi house and prepare for the soul awakening. Xiaolan thanked his grandfather but added that he still liked martial arts more than creativity. The Xiao mansion was training as usual. Xiaolan and Xiao Dao were practicing as usual. A subject reported that Princess Zishan had arrived to visit the Xiao mansion. Qing Yi laughed and called Xiaolan the invader of women. Xiaolan was afraid that something bad would happen. Princess Zishan entered the corridor leading behind the defenders. Xiaolan folded his arms and greeted the princess. Qing Yi apologized that she couldn't salute, but humbly greeted the princess. Zizhem asked Princess Qing Yi not to belittle herself so much. On the contrary, it was the princess who had the honor of seeing Qing Yi. Milady Qing Yi still wanted to know what was so interesting that Zishan had come to Xiao Mansion. The princess announced that Xiaolan had been appointed as a young marquis, a first-class viscount. But the main reason for coming was to visit Auntie Ching Yi. The defenders couldn't believe what they heard. Xiaolan was so easily appointed to the title of first class Viscount. Auntie told Xiaolan to bow down and receive the decree. He humbly obeyed Auntie Ching Yi. Zishan said that they were all martial arts practitioners together, and it wasn't worth being overly polite. King Yi ordered Xiaolan to show Princess Zijian the entire mansion. After the long journey, she must have been curious about it. Kaianshun wondered why Milady Ching Yi was not very happy about Xiaolan's new title. Auntie explained that his title was just an empty sound, but he had helped Xiaolan achieve a high position and become a role model. Not only would it add countless enemies to him, but it would also change his future path. 
If Xiaolan stays afloat, then so be it. But if something goes wrong, he will be at the bottom with no signs of returning. Xiaolan and Zishan were sitting in a small gazebo in the garden. Zishan congratulated Xiaolan on his new title. After which she asked if Xiaolan wanted to thank the princess for the title for the first time in the past thousand years. Xiaolan didn't think it was necessary. Zishan got angry and started to tell how she praised him in front of her father. Many families fight for this title, and Xiaolan devalued Zishan's labors. Xiaolan apologized and expressed what a wonderful person Zishan was as a friend and all-around human being, then expressed his deepest gratitude. Zishan said that it wouldn't be enough all the hard work she had done for him. Xiaolan asked why she didn't take the item from the main hall then. Zishan said that she didn't need the items at all, and she wanted Xiaolan to dedicate a poem to her like she did for Hong Do back then. Xiaolan explained. He had put his quill in a far corner and wanted to focus on cultivation. The soul festival was looming and maximum preparation was needed. Zishan allowed him to awaken his soul and shock the whole city. But he made a promise and had to write a poem. Xiaobushi finally learned more information about his nemesis, the Black Dragon. The subject said that the Blue Wolf also had to answer. He has a good relationship with the Emperor, but he also killed the bloody warriors in northern Xinjiang. The enemy was located in Su Xiancheng. Xiaobushi remembered how two emperors fought against six emperors. Half of the fifty emperors were bloody warriors. Xiaobushi said not to spread the news. At this time, he would lead the army. Qingyi was afraid that it might have been a trap. Xiaobushi told Qingyi not to worry. These bloody warriors faced each other in Beijiang, Dongfaibai, and Zhou Pingping. Other than them, no one else could harm Xiaobushi. After that, Xiaobushi told everyone to follow him, and he started a plan to avenge his son's murder. The Divine Soul Festival was the most significant festival on the continent. It was also the most important day in the lives of countless fighters. Many fighters who have reached the age of 18 will gather at the city pavilion to awaken their souls. In theory, almost all of the strongest warriors are spiritual warriors. These warriors have a higher cultivation speed and strong combat skills. The three dynasties were deeply concerned with soul soldiers, and they were a symbol of strength. Xiaolan asked Chen Shun if his awakening place was something like this. Chen Shun agreed that yes it was. Chen Shun asked what kind of soul Xiaolan wanted. He said that it didn't matter because everyone was good. But if it was a high-level soul, then he was already happy with it. Chen Shun was confident that Xiaolan and Shouda would both be able to awaken the divine soul. Auntie Qingyi asked the boys to stay alert and stay focused. Xiaolan asked Auntie if there happened to be too many people at the soul festival. Literally everyone was here. Auntie said that people with mediocre qualifications would also come to the soul pavilion. But they can still awaken the heavenly spirit. All big families should explore the future strengths of other families. And it's also an opportunity to recruit new talents. The doors in the nearest tower began to open. Everyone was pretty surprised by this. The man in the raincoat said that the soul festival had started. And only 365 people registered this year. Only 10 people are awakened at a time. If anyone hears their name, they should go to the Shenhong Pavilion. And the rest of us should wait outside. None of the people of the first round were able to awaken their souls. This frightened Xiaolan. Was the chance really that low? In the seventh round, one man was able to awaken his spirit. Xiao Chan Geng was the first. As soon as Xiao Chan Gen awakened, he began to be summoned by so many people. Qing Yi swept up that in the end, even a first level soldier's combat power increases. But for the four larger families, only a top-level warrior deserved an invitation. The new round was good. In this round, both were able to awaken. The Heavenly Healing Spirit and Xiao Tang's Tiger Spirit. Those who had awakened their souls immediately began to claim the Xiao family, supposedly believing themselves to be good candidates. Xiao Lan and Qing Lun happily welcomed the newcomer into the Xiao family. They were very pleased with him. The organizer announced the people for the new round. They were Xiao Yi, Xiao Lan, Xiao Dao, and Xiao Feng. Chen Zun and Auntie Qing Yi wished Xiaolan good luck in the upcoming Soul Festival test. Before entering, Xiaolan promised that he would not disappoint the people close to him at the Soul Awakening. Everyone went into the room and had to sit on the altar of the Soul. When the Soul awakens, the altar will shine. They shouldn't have been afraid, but rather relaxed. But if the altar dimmed, they had to leave immediately. The brothers wished each other good luck and dispersed to the nearest rooms that radiated light. Entering the room, Xiaolan saw a round altar surrounded by lamps. All sorts of animals were painted on the walls. As soon as Xiaolan sat down on the altar, his thoughts traveled to the world where he saw the infernal black dragon and the fiery phoenix blood demon. 
Xiao Lan liked this dimension. He beckoned the black dragon over to him and was even able to stroke its head. But suddenly his hand went through the beast and it just disappeared, leaving a yellow trail behind it. That yellow trail began to glow. Apparently Xiao Lan was interrupted by the spirit of holy order. The observing organizers praised Xiao Lan. He was able to summon the heavenly spirit, except that no one knew if he could take the chance and succeed in awakening it. Xiao Lan asked the huge yellow dragon to come over to him. He was worried and excited at the same time. The same purple vines that Xiao Lan had found at the bottom of the bottomless hole appeared from behind his back and enveloped the dragon. The purple grass just ripped the dragon apart. It exploded with yellow light and disappeared. The bewildered Xiao Lan tried to reach for the dragon and didn't understand how it happened. In his shouts, Xiao Lan found himself already back in the temple. He had successfully botched the awakening. It was like the purple grass had swallowed up all the souls that were inside this dimension. Xiao Lan's musings were disturbed by the words of the organizer. He said that the ceremony had come to an end and they needed to leave. The elder asked if Xiao Lan had managed to awaken his soul. Xiao Lan simply remained silent. Xiao Dao ran up to Xiao Lan and wondered if he had succeeded. Xiao Lan said he didn't understand it himself. It turned out that Xiao Dao didn't get any result either. Both brothers were broken. The elder pulled the nefarious fellows away and added that one must activate the soul and only then can one be certain. Summoning a spirit was very easy. You had to concentrate on finding the spirit and call out to it and then it should appear. After a few minutes of trying, Xiao Lan succeeded. His hand emitted a purple blade of grass, although the soul looked imposing. But the elder said that it was a helpless soul. Grass, vines, flowers, and so on are trash spirits. Even though Xiao Lan's was purple, it was obvious that this soul was complete trash. All because this grass didn't have any attributes, human step, heavenly step, or sacred order. The master had worked in the soul pavilion for over 30 years and his opinion couldn't be wrong. He felt sorry about Xiao Lan's soul. Xiao Lan walked out. Behind his back, the organizer announced which souls had been obtained. One celestial spirit, five ordinary spirits, and one useless spirit. No one could believe that Xiaolan himself had awakened the useless spirit. But looking at how broken Xiaolan was, one could realize that it was true. Qing Lan knew that he would one day capture the Xiao family and trash like Xiaolan would never fight against the heavens. But even for the arrogant Qing Lan, it was strange that Xiaolan was unable to awaken any useful souls. Chamu ran up to Xiao Lan and said that he would always be his friend and would help him in any way he could. Xiao Lan thanked him, but said he wanted to be by himself now. Hongdo asked why Xiao Lan had such a face. Xiao Lan said it just looked like garbage. Hongdo took a bigger swing and slapped Xiao Lan's face for his words about himself. She explained to Xiao Lan that just because he had awakened a useless soul didn't mean that the whole world was ruined. Even though the soul was trash, Xiao Lan was not trash himself. Hongdo added that there were no shortcuts. Most strong warriors with a spirit. But that didn't mean they always relied on the spirit. And if one day, Xiao Lan could smile and become himself again, he could come to the Hongdo family and appeal to her. She was willing to marry Xiao Lan. Because Xiao Lan was the first person who made her heart tremble in 19 years, Hundo added that if Hundo's family agrees, she will marry him without a second thought. Xiao Lan remembered all of his journey all of his endeavors, and all of the loved ones that treasured Xiao Lan with all of their hearts. Already in Qing Yi's house, Xiao Lan was practicing with his last strength. Qing Yi said that he could rest, but Xiao Lan refused to do so. A subject came to the training place and reported that the owner of the house was calling Xiao Lan to come over. The auntie told Xiao Lan to go back. It turns out that the five universities had again sent an invitation to Xiao Lan to invite him for his bachelor's degree. And the elders had a discussion after which they decided to send Xiao Lan to Shui Shi Pavilion. Xiao Lan was not pleased that they had already tried to throw him out of the family. He said that he promised himself never to write literature again. But the decision for the pavilion was made by the elders and higher ranks in the Xiao family. Xiao Lan would not have achieved great success in martial arts, but could bring the family grace in literature. Unfortunately, Xiao Lan had no choice. Even the old men nearby insisted on him leaving. The Xiao family does not support trash in martial arts. Xiao Lan was completely depressed. The Xiao family wanted to kick him out as soon as he received the useless spirit. Everything had already been decided, and Xiao Lan would be picked up to be taken to the Zhuisha Pavilion the next day. Xiao Lan said again that he wasn't going anywhere and demanded Xiao Bushi's grandfather Xiao Bushi to the conversation. Qing Lun told Xiao Lan not to forget who he was because he was from the Xiao family and had to follow the family's rules. 
Furious Xiaolan turned around and asked to be crossed out of the Xiu family, then started to walk away. Xinglun didn't like Xiaolan's attitude toward the elders. He was arrogant trash, but trash was trash, and the Xiao family was already almost in Xinglun's hands. So he didn't care much about Xiaolan. The same guy with a special aura spoke to Xiaolan. He said that he believed in Xiaolan's strength. They were both kind of chosen, and it was hard for both of them to become stronger. Xiao Lan apologized for not being able to help him, but said with a laugh, mauling after a while, he would make the world shudder. Xiao Lan was lying on the grass. Suddenly he noticed his hand began to speak. A small blade of grass with a face appeared on Xiao Lan's palm. But as soon as Xiao Lan personally spoke to the blade of grass, it began to remain silent. The blade of grass just twisted and turned from side to side. Xiao Lan began to press the grass morally, asking what she wanted from Xiao Lan and what she meant by her words. Suddenly, Xiaolan's body was enveloped by an aura. The mysterious spiritual energy seemed to be a high-level soldier. This was a very strange occurrence. The herb said that if it was gone, the aura would also be gone. And then it hit Xiaolan. This soul could add energy. Xiaolan decided to train a little with his soul. He devoted two whole hours to training, and his soul pace tripled. Although normally it could only double in speed. As it turned out, the blade of grass did not scare the eight-claw golden dragon, but absorbed it. Xiaolan was now convinced that this soul was not useless. But Xiaolan still didn't have any magical abilities. Even though he didn't care, it didn't stop him from becoming much more powerful. Xiao Qingbao spoke out at Aunt Qing Yi about Xiaolan's words. He caused trouble in the elders' hall and was rude to them, and if it wasn't for them, Xiaolan would have been expelled from the family. Xiao Qingbao added that training Xiao Lan with a useless soul was just wasting their resources. For his kindness, the elders offered Xiao Lan to go to Shui Shi Pavilion, but he refused. Qing Yi said that if Xiao Qingbao couldn't keep Xiao's status in Xiao Lan's name, then let him not try. But if they kicked him out, then let Qing Yi be kicked out too. Yi Xiao Qingbao started shouting, asking Qing Yi if she thought she was still the princess of the Xiao family. But she was old and paralyzed, or rather overconfident. Xiao Qingbao added that the patriarchs could not support her forever, and she could not fly to the sky on their account. King Yi had heard everything and was not going to continue to endure it. She shouted at Xiao Qingbao to get out and threw him with her strength outside the building. The frightened Xiao Qingbao decided to leave safely. While leaving he met Xiao Lan, but they silently passed through each other. Xiao Lan came to his aunt and said that he wanted to leave the Xiao family. Qing Yi asked him to wait for his grandfather Xiao Bushi to arrive. King Yi asked Xiao Lan not to stop practicing. He and Xiao Dao could find their innate souls. Xiao Lan was surprised at these words. He thought that his purple grass was already an innate soul. The already interested Xiao Lan sat down at the table and began to ask Auntie Qing Yi about innate souls. The world is so vast. There are so many things in it. And an innate soul is a magical thing that exists in this world. The reason why Auntie wanted to help Xiao Lan find the spirit was simple. Grandpa Xiaobushi knew places where one could find such a spirit very easily. An innate soul is full of power. It might be a fire soul, an ice spirit, or the essence of a mysterious beast. In no time, Xiaobushi and Qing Yi will be able to do their best to find Xiaolan's innate soul. Xiaolan asked what the power of the innate soul was and wanted to see it. He was very curious. Qing Yi said that the Xiao family had information about it, but only Xiaobushi and a couple other members of the Xiao family could see it. Whether the innate souls are strong or not, no one knew that. But the three people that had absorbed innate souls were very strong and their cultivation knew no bounds. Xiaolan thought about these words. Perhaps his soul was stronger than the celestial soul after all. The cultivation speed of the celestial soul usually doubled, while his tripled. In five days, Cha Mu and Xiaolan sat around the table talking about everything. When the topic came up about Hongdo's birthday party invitation, Xiaolan said he would go. Chamu added that Ms. Hongdo could open a private banquet in the backyard. Xiao Lan was happy about it, but he didn't know if he could give a decent gift. After all, he was a poor man himself. Chamu was glad that good old Xiao Lan had returned and was as healthy as ever. Later, after the meeting, Xiao Lan went to the dark forest. It was late at night. Xiao Lan commanded the soul to come out, and the large purple line began to become bigger and bigger. After which, he commanded his soul to return, and immediately, the purple grass was sucked back into Xiao Lan's hand. Xiao Lan could not understand the properties of his soul. It could stretch, strengthen, as well as be released. If this soul was indeed stronger than the heavenly soul, 
then Xiao Lan should have practiced more. It was already getting light and Xiao Lan should have returned home, after which he should immediately go to the party. Xiao Lan finally came to the party. Some people recognized him as trash and speculated where he might have been hiding. Chamu immediately noticed Xiao Lan and happily started calling him over to say hello properly. Xiao Lan finally approached the culprit of the celebration. Hong Do was happy to see him here. Xiao Lan held out a box to Hong Do as a gift. In the box was a handful of paper birds that were made quite neatly. To his gift, Xiao Lan added some affectionate words about Hong Do's beauty this evening, 